is a special edition of ABC News Nightline. AIDS is surreptitiously spreading throughout our population. It's time we knew exactly what we were facing. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS. We don't yet know how to cure it. We have no choice but to deal with it. Several of our affiliated stations across the country have added their resources to ours as we examine the medical, legal, social, religious, and emotional impact of AIDS on our country and on the rest of the world. I'm not dating anyone now, but before I do, I will definitely make him and myself be checked for it because I just think that it's too important. I never thought having an intimate relationship would be a matter of life or death. But because of AIDS, I'm afraid. But listen, if you're doing anything, you use one of these. You understand? Because my baby is not getting AIDS. We are um, seeing a great increase in uh, policies being taken out shortly before somebody uh, uh, dies of AIDS. And that is, the, that is a real problem for us. My lover died in 1984. Had we been able to get this drug in 1984, he might be alive today. He played many parts and many roles in my life. He was a father, a brother, a mother, a sister. But most important, he was my best friend. When someone sleeps with someone else, has intercourse, you have to look at it this way, that you're sleeping with everyone that other person slept with and who those people slept with. If you, like, made out with someone, you wouldn't get it if they had it. The AIDS issue has hurt the blood banking industry, obviously. Um, a lot of it has to do with just not being well informed. You got AIDS, you got all kinds of infections, your immune system is completely ruined and you're going to die in a few in some time, why not end it now and just get it over with? Before this is over, this is going to touch almost every household in this country. It's not a time for judgment, it's a time for caring. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel reporting tonight from Los Angeles and this is a special edition of Nightline, a national town meeting on AIDS. We are joined, as you can see, by a live audience. We'll be taking some of their questions and comments. To a limited degree, some of you will be able to interact with us also. Those of you watching this program on television will see two toll-free telephone numbers on your screen. I should point out that we are also being joined tonight by a national radio audience. For their benefit, let me read those toll-free numbers now. I'll be repeating them later in the broadcast. In California only, call 800-227-8234. That's 800-227-8234. For the rest of the country, the number is 800-624-7564. That's 800-624-7564. What our television audience is seeing now are the faces of and a list with the names of our expert panelists. We have 19 guests whose expertise ranges from medicine and psychology to insurance, law, and prostitution. We have guests from the arts, politics, and religion. And our point in booking this many experts is not that we expect to spend a great deal of time with each of them, but that we wanted to be sure that no matter what aspect on the subject of AIDS comes up, we will have at least one expert who can address the issue. So much for the introduction. Now, let's begin. But where to begin? Certainly the most desperate among you, those who are listening to and watching this program with the greatest sense of urgency, are those who have been touched by the virus in one form or another. Those of you who are fearful of dying, and those of you even more fearful, perhaps, of watching a loved one die. Let me say at the outset, there is no cure. You will want to know what hope there is for a cure, how close the scientists may be. You will want to know about remedies that friends or friends of friends have heard about. At one point or another this evening, we will talk about all those things. But we need also talk about how we as a society of largely decent and compassionate people are going to react when the fear of AIDS causes us to grasp at legal straws. We need to discuss testing, mandatory and otherwise. We need to talk about isolating high-risk groups. 
about quarantining people who are carriers. We need to talk about privacy and the right to be protected against real danger. And we need to separate what is real from what is imaginary. We need to do what we as Americans pride ourselves on doing best, exchanging good information. In Washington today, 6,000 of the world's leading experts on AIDS completed a week-long conference. So there is a better sense of what we know. Here's ABC's medical editor, Dr. Timothy Johnson. As the international conference in Washington this week made clear, when it comes to AIDS, the old adage is painfully apt. The more we learn, the more we realize how much we don't know. Let's begin with what we do know. First and foremost, we understand that the basic cause of this deadly syndrome is a virus, now labeled HIV, for human immunodeficiency virus. It is a virus that enters human cells, multiplies itself, and in the process destroys the host cell. However, its most devilish property is that it may be impossible to eradicate once it has set up shop in human cells. Dr. Anthony Fauci coordinates AIDS research at the National Institutes of Health. The genetic material of the virus inserts itself into the genetic material of the cell and it just sits there. It has the capability of rapidly multiplying and killing the cell, but it also has the very diabolical capability of just resting there in a way that is hidden from the defenses of the body. We have also learned that the virus is particularly destructive because it attacks the T4 cells, cells which direct the body's immune system. The destruction of these cells renders the human organism vulnerable to attack on many fronts. Now imagine a situation in which the first thing that a virus attacks is the very cell that's supposed to protect the body against the virus. So you're essentially wiping out the defense system of the body on the very first day of the war. Finally, we have learned that the AIDS virus is spread only by contact that allows the transfer of infected blood or body fluids into the bloodstream of another person. Even cases where healthcare workers have become infected involve direct contact with contaminated blood. In short, AIDS is not transmitted by normal social interaction, or even sneezing or coughing. Even most kissing is safe. Putting your arm around someone, giving them a kiss, even a kiss on the lip, does not at all seem to transmit the virus. There's zero evidence that is transmitted that way. What we don't know for sure is whether or not deep, heavy kissing with exchange of substantial amount of saliva can actually transmit the virus. However, it is not what we know that keeps AIDS a hot topic at conferences like this or on the front pages. What feeds the growing hysteria about this devastating disease is what we don't know, namely how to control this virus in the millions who are already infected. Dr. Jonathan Mann of the World Health Organization reminded the AIDS conference just how staggering that problem already is. If worldwide, 5 to 10 million people are currently HIV infected, and assuming that 10 to 30 percent of these persons will develop AIDS during the next five years, then from 500,000 to 3 million new AIDS cases will emerge from persons already infected today with HIV. So where do we stand in the fight against this virus which has so much deadly potential? There are currently several dozen drugs in various stages of preliminary testing in centers throughout the world. They are designed to halt the virus at critical points in its life cycle. This week it was announced that one of them, a chemical cousin of AZT known as DDC, will enter expanded human trials in the very near future. However, so far, the FDA has approved only one drug, AZT, for use beyond research settings. AZT acts by interfering with an enzyme that facilitates viral replication in the cell. Dr. Sam Broder, a leader in drug development, spoke about the latest results from AZT studies at this week's conference. This drug, therefore, was able to prolong survival. It is not a cure. Its effects may not last in many patients, but I don't see how anyone can conclude that there isn't something that can be done about AIDS. The story is pretty much the same with vaccine development. Dr. Fauci foresees steady but slow progress. What we're looking at now is that very likely by the end of 1987, we'll be seeing the very early testing in humans. It is very likely that even if we are successful in developing a safe and effective vaccine, that one will not be readily available to the general public by at least 
no earlier than the mid-1990s, probably 1995. Because we cannot yet eradicate the virus with medication or prevent it with vaccination, the best answer to AIDS right now is social change through education. Which is to say that even though we have come an amazingly long way scientifically, it is not yet far enough to wipe out our fear and uncertainty. Dr. Timothy Johnson for Nightline. And it is with Dr. Timothy Johnson that I want to begin. Tim, uh, just to clarify so that we can start with some basics. Terms that are thrown around, HIV, ARC, ARC, AIDS itself. Would you quickly and as plainly as you can explain the difference among those three? Well, HIV is the current and accepted name for the virus that causes this syndrome. And it can cause a range of disease problems from the asymptomatic state initially to full-blown AIDS, lethal AIDS, within months. There may be some intermediate stages, which we often refer to as ARC. The point is that once the virus gets into the human body, it has the potential to do everything from sit there silently for many, many years without causing any problem to causing death within months and everything in between. Dr. Fauci in, in Washington, you are generally recognized as one of the world's leading experts on this subject. Is it fatal is any one of these forms of, of association with AIDS necessarily fatal? Well, at the present time, uh, there is a drug that can prolong the life of individuals with HIV infection and serious pneumonia, such as pneumocystis carani pneumonia. But apart from that, the infection with HIV itself can potentially kill anyone who is infected with the virus. A large number of people are asymptomatic and have absolutely no symptoms at all and are doing well. But as Dr. Johnson mentioned, you have a gradation from individuals with slight symptoms, which may go on to full-blown AIDS. But apart from the therapy that we mentioned with AZT, the, the prognosis for people with full-blown AIDS is really very, very bad at the present time. Yeah, let me interrupt you for a moment because I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about people with full-blown AIDS. What I'm trying to get to is whether someone who has this, this early uh, manifestation of AIDS is necessarily going to develop full-blown AIDS and will therefore die. Do you know yet whether all of these people are going to die? Do you have a sense yet of what percentage of them are going to die if the answer is that all of them won't? Well, if you presume that full-blown AIDS is fatal and you look at something like ARC or AIDS-related complex, there is a, uh, a percentage of individuals over a period of time who will go on to develop the full-blown uh, syndrome AIDS. Individuals who have just ARC, in fact, however, and this is not generally appreciated, can be sick enough that they can die from just ARC. ARC can be a very serious syndrome. You don't necessarily have to have full-blown AIDS. All right, I'll tell you what I'd like to do, just so that we can muscle flex a little <laughs> bit. I'd like to get to a couple of the questioners here in the audience. If you can, Stay roughly on the same subject, uh, because we're going to try and do this as, as logically as we can as we go through the evening. Go ahead, sir, if you'd ask the first question, please. Yes, um, I basically would like to ask the senator, or the congressman, I mean, why is it that a person has to have a death sentence knowing when he's going to die before he can qualify for Medi-Cal to get on some of the different treatment programs to try to prevent there to be a the ending of the spread of the virus was too late. Okay, I'll tell you what, you're, you're doing what I hoped you wouldn't do, and that is you're taking us way off in another direction, but uh, Congressman, you've already been promoted to Senator. Give the man a good answer. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, Medi-Cal uh, benefits, uh, which are jointly paid by the federal and the state government, are available to anyone in our country uh, who is in need of medical treatment. Uh, I don't believe the premise the gentleman stated is correct, that uh, you have to have a sentence of death before you're eligible. Uh, there are some thresholds of uh, property that uh, uh, one has to establish in order to be eligible for coverage under Medi-Cal, but uh, our society has made very clear that uh, we will make medical services available to people on the basis of the need for medical services, and uh, that's the way it is. All right. Now, I promise all of you, we will get to all of the subjects or all aspects of the subject that you want to discuss before this evening is over, but let's see if we can progress a little bit logically. We have a phone call from Missouri that I hope is more on the, more on the subject. Go ahead, caller. Hello. I'd like to know, does a, a mother with the HIV or ARC pass on the infection to the unborn child and does the pregnancy cause the virus to become full-blown? 
All right, let me introduce another one of our guests now, Dr. Paul Volbeding, uh, forgive me, from Not San easy. Francisco Hospital. Uh, what's the answer to that? Well, the, the infection with, with this virus, with HIV, is one that women can get, usually because they use intravenous drugs or because their sexual partners use intravenous drugs. Once a woman is infected, she does have a, the ability to pass this virus on to, uh, to newborns. Usually we think the infection occurs before the birth process and we expect that about 50% of children born to, to women that are infected will themselves be infected with this virus with a high chance of developing AIDS. Why would it only be 50%? I mean, you cannot have a, a closer exchange of bodily fluids than you would have between a fetus and, and a mother to be. Actually, there are, there are barriers between the fetal blood and the, and the maternal blood which prevent the transmission of most infections from the from the mother to the to the to the newborn in this case about 50 percent of the time the virus is able to get across that barrier all right if we can let's keep the questions for the moment on the subject of how you get aids and what it is that you can expect from aids uh let's go first to one more uh, of our guests here in the audience go ahead sir if you'd like to pose your question and then we have another call i have this question for congressman dannemeyer about sure. testing um, what would be the public benefit of mandatory blood tests for all high-risk groups in this country? And why do you consider routine testing to be a cop-out? All right, I'll tell you what, you've taken us in a direction, once again, uh, folks, I know, you get to the microphone, you want to ask your question. You've taken us again to, uh, uh, in, in a direction that we, we didn't want to go just yet, but we will, because I, I want to show okay. you we are ready to go. So, Congressman Dannemeyer, we're going to go into testing, and then we've got Gary Bauer sitting in Washington. Let's move into that area. Go ahead. The reason that we're talking about testing people for the virus in America today is because we have not been pursuing a normal, customary, routine response in dealing with communicable disease, specifically reportability. If we had been reporting those with the virus routinely, as we should have been for at least the last two or three years, we would, we would know today how many people have the virus in our country. That's but since we don't true. know that fact, what good would that and, do? Well, you're not asking the right question. No, why the do we? Question. No, wait, wait, wait. Why, I'll tell you what, folks. Why just, do just we? Just so that so that our radio audience has a chance, at least, <laughs> of following along with this. If you're going to interrupt, at least say hi. This is Jeff Levy, and that's who was trying to interrupt there a moment ago. Uh, okay, no, Con Congressman. You, the no, question... Wait just a minute. Wait just a minute, Mr. Levy. If you want to know what do we gain from from uh, reportability or testing. Then the question you should be asking, why do we report routinely the presence of 58 communicable diseases in the state of California? Why do we gather statistical information on them? The answer is, there are three, pas three basic reasons why we report. One, we want to know the magnitude of the problem. Secondly, we want to cure it if we can. And third, we want to prevent the transmissibility of the people. We have not been following this routine practice of reportability for those with the virus. And because we haven't been doing that, now we have to find out how many people in the country have it because that tells our public policy officials what steps we should be taking. Let, so me, let, me, let me stop you right there and let me tell the audience we've got a lot more on mandatory testing. We have got our own report on the subject. I know Mr. Levy wants to be able to respond. We have got Gary Bauer from the White House who is sitting in Washington who has his own ideas about where there should be mandatory testing, where there should be voluntary testing, and where there should be routine testing. We'll get into all of that when we return in just a moment. Fixing this One of the biggest controversies to emerge from this week's AIDS conference in Washington has been over the issue of testing for AIDS. And in a couple of minutes, we're going to have a report uh, from WPLG in Miami on that very subject, but we have a question on that subject now, what, from this gentleman over here? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, my name is Glenn Myers. I'm a UCLA student. Uh, I'd like to know, um, both Repu uh, um, Congressman Dannemeyer and the other people on the panel, uh, if you're for AIDS testing and mandatory AIDS testing, what do you suppose should be done about the prejudice and the backlash that's going to go against those who test positive? I'll tell you what, before Congressman Dannemeyer or anybody else responds to that, let me ask your indulgence. 
we can turn this into a political test of wills between those who favor one position or another position. That's not what we're here for tonight. We're going to try and exchange information. I would ask you not to hiss, not to boo, not to applaud. Let's just go on with the program. Now, Jeff Levy, you wanted to make a point before. We'll, we'll get to Congressman Dannemeyer in a moment. Unfortunately, Mr. Dannemeyer's solutions are somewhat simplistic. He's applying models for other diseases to AIDS, and unfortunately, AIDS is unlike any other disease. Uh, if Mr. Dannemeyer wants to know how many people are infected, you don't do that through mandatory reporting. You do that through a zero prevalence study, a random study of the population to find out how many people are indeed infected. I think everyone wants to know that. We need to know that to plan our, for our health care facilities, to know where to target our education programs, and so on. <coughs> That's the solution to the problem that Mr. Dannemeyer poses, not mandatory reporting. You always offer the, the alternative the example of syphilis. Well, the reason you can do mandatory reporting and, and contact tracing with something like syphilis is because there is a medical intervention. For any person, whether testing positive or negative, our only intervention at this time is counseling. And in fact, if we want to effectively stop the spread of this disease, you want to do a voluntary testing and counseling program with the emphasis of, on counseling. All the public health experts in this country say that count testing is at best an adjunct to counseling. What we want to do is convince people, whether they test positive or negative, that counseling, that, that changing their behavior is what needs to be done to protect themselves and to protect others. And indeed, by separating out the positives from the negatives, you are misleading people who are engaging in risky behavior, but who may at this time be testing negative. You're misleading them into thinking that they don't need to worry about this disease. What we need to be willing to do is be frank about sex, talk about sex, and not hide behind some easy solution like testing lots of people. Jeff, among the many folks that I'm going to ask not to give speeches are also our panelists tonight. So let's keep the answers relatively brief if we can. I'd like to go now to that report that we have ready from Art Carlson, who's a reporter of ABC affiliate WPLG in Miami. He looks at why the subject of testing is creating so much concern in the country. Of all the issues, fears, and confusion surrounding AIDS, nothing has prompted more debate than the specter of mandatory testing. Should people be tested for exposure to the AIDS virus, and if so, who controls the information? President Reagan has come out squarely in favor of testing. He's asked that AIDS be added to the list of contagious diseases by which immigrants can be denied entrance to the U.S. The administration plans to evaluate all federal prisoners, is considering whether to test in the VA hospitals, and has urged all states to offer routine testing. It's time we knew exactly what we were facing. And that's why I support some routine testing. I've asked the Department of Health and Human Services to determine as soon as possible the extent to which the AIDS virus has penetrated our society and to predict its future dimensions. Health authorities estimate the president's program could directly affect millions of Americans. But the greatest concern over the test is not the test itself. Rather, is it possible to guarantee confidentiality? AIDS researcher, Dr. Margaret Fischel. I think if the test is done anonymously, yes. If it is done confidentially, no. I am not convinced ultimately what mandatory testing would actually give us, other than saying how many individuals are truly infected, uh, other than panicking a large amount of the population, and causing individuals to seek medical care later in their illness. The single test for AIDS antibodies is recognized as being far from perfect, with erroneous results about 25 to 30 percent of the time. But fear of the virus is so great that many people who test positive don't wait to be retested. It is, to their minds, a death sentence. In the past two months alone, seven people here in South Florida have committed suicide after being told they tested positive for exposure to the virus. Only one, a young heterosexual woman, is known to have contacted the Health Crisis Network seeking help beforehand. And we had her lined up for counseling that evening to come into a support group. And between the time that I received the call from her in the afternoon and the support group that evening, um, she apparently decided to make some choices. There are no national standardized guidelines for how the information from test results is given to the patient. In many instances, and with no counseling, Results are sent over the phone and through letters. Sometimes the news is even given to unsuspecting family members. 
I'm familiar with a case that uh, a man was tested, and rather than to arrange an appointment for him to come in and receive the results, the wife was notified over the phone of his results. And she didn't know? And she had no idea that he had even been tested. If an individual who tests positive for exposure to AIDS survives the emotional trauma, there are additional hurdles to be faced on the job. The stigma surrounding AIDS virtually guarantees discrimination. Todd Shuttleworth is a case in point. In 1984, he was one of the first victims of a Broward County, Florida directive calling for the automatic firing of anyone diagnosed with AIDS. As soon as they told me I would lose my job, it's sort of a hopeless feeling. I lost my insurance, which is probably the most important thing that I need right now. I'm going to probably lose my car because I won't be able to make payments. So I won't be able to go to the University of Miami AIDS Center. I'm not going to have enough money, basically, just to, uh, to live. Shuttleworth filed suit, but settled out of court for back wages and medical costs. He was offered another job with the county and accepted, but eventually moved to San Francisco. The county's directive was quietly shelved and has not been used since. This is Michael. May I help you? Michael Bilheimer, a counselor at Miami's Health Crisis Network, knows he's been exposed to the AIDS virus. Voluntary testing confirmed it. If people are taken out of the workplace, they're taken out educational uh, surroundings, what are they going to do with their lives? We're going to put them in, in camps. At the moment, nine states require that those who test positive be reported to the appropriate health authorities. Efforts in eight other states to set up similar requirements failed last year. When we begin to look at quarantining people, where are we going to put these? And what are we going to do with these individuals? Are we just going to extinguish their life? That's my question. I mean, that's the fear I have there. The fear of that is even greater than the fear of the illness. Much greater. The issue of civil rights has produced a subtle but significant change in the focus of the AIDS epidemic. Up to now, most of the attention has centered on death and the number of people dying. Sobering to be sure, but the reality of the matter is that more and more people will be living with AIDS in the next few years. And those involved in the midst of the crisis say unless that situation is dealt with responsibly and soon, we run the very real risk of becoming a society permanently divided by fear and ignorance. From Miami, I'm Art Carlson reporting for ABC's Nightline. Now, we have a number of issues that have been raised by Art Carlson's report. Standing by in Washington now is Gary Bauer, who is domestic advisor to President Reagan, in particular on the subject of AIDS policy. Uh, pick up on the, on the question of confidentiality versus anonymity. In other words, if we are going to have mandatory testing, if we are going to have routine testing, is the government going to somehow guarantee that the, that the identity of the people who come in to be tested, that their, that their anonymity will be guaranteed, or are we simply going to assure them of confidentiality? Well, I think you have the same right of confidentiality as you do with any medical information. When somebody goes in for a physical, they don't expect to read the results <coughs> of the paper the next day, uh, nor to have those results reported to individuals that they don't authorize. We've not seen any evidence that the current medical system ensuring confidentiality is in any major way flawed. And we would expect, assume, and urge the same precautions to be used with the results from AIDS tests. Do you think, however, that the, the kind of stigma that attaches itself to that information coming out, namely that someone has AIDS, is really comparable to any other disease you can think of right now? Well, I don't think the question of stigma is I heavy enough issue to overcome the public health concern. <clears throat> if you look at the president's recommendations, for example, on testing immigrants, we routinely do that now for other infectious and contagious diseases. To not do it for AIDS would be, I think, bizarre public policy. Well, I've got to ask you, and, and we're going to go to another uh, couple of our experts in Washington in a moment, I'm not quite sure I understand what it is you're proposing to do with regard to the mandatory testing uh, of immigrants. First of all, are you going to test them over there or are you going to test them over here? Well, the uh, federal government will have to work out the details. I think in most cases we will test in other countries if the facilities are available. In a number of countries we have some preliminary information that the facilities aren't good. In those cases we may need to do the blood testing here. What are you going to do with those folks after you've tested them? You're not going to have the results in an hour or two. You're going to put them into kind of temporary isolation until you're through testing them? Well, we, there, there will be problems with the program. The point is that with all other infectious diseases on the dangerous and contagious list, we routinely test and we keep out those aliens, those immigrants carrying the diseases. Again, to do that for syphilis, tuberculosis, 
but not do it for AIDS would be rather unusual. No, 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 I, I, I understand, Mr. Barrett, but what I'm getting to is that the, the amount of... For example, someone could have a sexual contact, and Dr. Fauci, you're, you're there in Washington, too, so you correct me when I start going wrong, or Tim Johnson. Uh, you could have a sexual contact, let's say, today. You could be tested, say, in Naples, Italy, two weeks from today. You could test negative. Uh, the test results come in a couple of days later. You hop on the ship or the plane a week after that. You come into the United States, and as much as a month or two months or three months later, you could test positive. Now, what, what good does that do? Well, if you're suggesting that some people with AIDS will still make it through into the country, no one's arguing with you. But the testing will keep out significant numbers of people who would otherwise enter into the country. No test is going to be perfect, but the public policy goal here is to limit as much as you can immigrants coming into the country with the disease. How about, how about foreign businessmen? Now, our, our suggestion was only on those seeking permanent residence for whom the American taxpayer will foot the bill if, in fact, they fall ill with this disease. Okay, a Leonard Matlevich. businessman would not fall into that category. Leonard Matlevich, uh, you were at one point kicked out of the Air Force when it was found that you were a homosexual. Uh, you later got a judgment that uh, rather than reinstating you, what would you get, $160,000 mm -hmm. or something? Correct. And you now have AIDS. And now I have AIDS. All right, you wanted to get in on this. Yeah, with uh, Mr. Bauer, I think one of the main problems is that we are six years into this crisis now and this administration has really done nothing. And I'm, what, what, what really scares me is the Oliver Norse are loose in the White House on AIDS. Well, wait a second. I, I don't understand what that means. Well, we're, we're being taken on a roller coaster. Uh, testing is not the issue. Well, clearly, a great many people in this country think that testing is the issue. We've got a phone call from Georgia. Caller, you want to come in? Get on, Missy. Go ahead. Hello? Yeah, what you may have to do is turn your radio or your television down, but uh, go ahead with your call. Okay, uh, is that me? It's Hello, you. this is Bob Coffey. I'm calling from Douglas, Georgia. We're counting you on WDMG. Uh, nothing political. I have a simple question. With the people that don't fall under the high-risk categories, confidentiality is a problem with some people, but a big problem for many people is do I really want to know what suggestions would you make to people who might want to be tested that don't fall under these high-risk categories but are just concerned about the spread of the disease itself. Dr. Volberding? I think, it's a, I think it's an important question. Many people are very anxious right now about being infected with this virus. Many of them have very little reason to be anxious about it, but they're living with the anxiety, and they're suffering because of the anxiety. For those people, I suggest strongly that they go to their physician and, and or to an alternative testing site, an anonymous testing site, and have the test <coughs> done and find out. Most of them will find out that they're negative. And, and then can go on about their lives and hopefully, as, as Jeff Levy said, get some education to help keep them negative. All right, we're going to take a break in just a moment. Tell me quickly, if people want to know, is there a general place in cities and communities around the country, uh, or, or do you have to, I mean, wh where do you look in the you phone book? You have to search it out a bit. There, it varies a lot from community to community and from state to state. Some states have provided testing sites that are anonymous, others haven't. Asking uh, public health departments in your city is probably a place to start. All right, we have to take another break. We'll be back in just a moment. To arrange all. Taken one at a time, they are individual tragedies. Collectively, they represent the depletion of a national resource. They are our actors and athletes. Our makeup artists and fashion designers are musicians, politicians, lawyers, and journalists. They are us, and they are dying at the peaks of their careers, in what should have been the prime of their lives. Way Bandy, makeup artist whose famous customers included Nancy Reagan and Elizabeth Taylor, Mary Tyler Moore, and Barbara Walters. Way Bandy, dead at 45. Stuart McKinney, Republican congressman from Connecticut, a liberal on social issues, an expert on federal housing law, Stuart McKinney was serving his 16th year in the House when he died, aged 56. Jerry Smith, tight end for the Washington Redskins, made 421 pass receptions and scored 60 touchdowns between 1965 and 1977. Jerry Smith was 43 when he died. Barry Lowen was vice president for creative affairs for the production company that brings us Dynasty and The Love Boat. 
Lowen was also known as one of Hollywood's most influential contemporary art collectors. He was 50. Perry Ellis, the fashion designer, whose sportswear glorified the clean-cut, all-American look, was 46. Terry Dolan, who created and led the conservative political lobby known as Nick Pack, was only 36. Ricky Wilson, lead guitarist for the rock group known as the B-52s, was just 32. Rock Hudson was 59. And so was the flamboyant and often controversial attorney, Roy Cohn. Liberace was 67. He is by far among the older people on the AIDS casualty list. In years to come, we should probably accustom ourselves to finding the names of more women on that list. And children, too. Their names won't be so well known to us, of course, nor will we know who they might have become. Let me just tell those of you who are listening on the radio that uh, we are currently showing our television audience some numbers that you can call if you would like to participate in this program with us. Uh, in California only, we would ask that you call 1-800-227-8234. That's 1-800-227-8234. For the rest of the country, we have one number, and that is 1-800-624-7564. That's 1-800-624-7564. We are going to be on the air, and we've already been on the air for about 40, 45 minutes. We're going to be on the air for at least four hours tonight. We have a panel here in Los Angeles with me uh, of 12 people who are experts in a number of different areas. Uh, and we are joined also in Washington by uh, some scientific experts and in New York. A lot of guests we haven't even uh, approached yet, and I'm going to approach one of them right now because she mentioned to me during the, uh, during the break that prostitutes in America are particularly concerned uh, about the question of AIDS testing. Carol Lee, you are, what do you call it, a sex worker? Uh, however, some of us are more familiar with the, with the term prostitute. You belong to an organization called Coyote, which stands for what? Call off your old tired ethics. It's All right. a prostitutes rights organization. Thank you. Um, it was founded by Margot St. James. All right. Now, tell us, uh, now, now that we, uh, you know, I, uh, we, uh, one of the things we've got to do tonight, and I guess I'm, I'm the one who's having the most trouble with it because I'm the one stumbling over my own tongue, is uh, to learn to talk about some of these things openly and easily. Prostitution, quite clearly, is one profession in which, first of all, the people who practice that profession are very vulnerable to getting any kind of venereal disease, AIDS among it, and are also likely to pass it on. Talk about it for me. Well, not exactly. Actually, I, I really did, wanted not to move the spotlight to prostitutes too soon because according to the U.S. Department of Health statistics, prostitutes pass on less than 5% of the venereal diseases in general, and that's e even a lower figure in regard to AIDS. Studies have also shown that prostitutes, for the most part, use condoms, and um, that is protection against AIDS. Um, so what we find, though, is that the laws for mandatory testing are coming out against the prostitutes first. Where, besides the, uh, now the laws haven't been passed yet, but we well, found that in California there, there's a, a, a bill called the Doolittle Bill, and in many other states there are similar bills. Bring, it, bring it back, Carol, to the, to the question of mandatory testing. Why, for example, would you object to mandatory testing? One would think that would be a very sensible thing for a, for a prostitute to do, well, to be tested. voluntary testing sounds like a sensible thing for a prostitute to do. But mandatory testing means that there's a government record. And uh, according to the Doolittle Bill, they want to make it a felony for a prostitute who's tested positive to engage in sex. Now, many prostitutes engage in manual sorts of stimulation and do have sex with condoms and practice 100% safe sex. And they've found that prostitutes don't test any higher for exposure to the antibody than other women with multiple partners. So we object to being scapegoated. And as a matter of fact, we are being scapegoated in many of the states, and there aren't very, very many people to speak up for us. Anyone on the panel who wants to well, speak like up? To or? Say something. Go ahead, all right. <laughs> I, I, I assume, Con Congressman Dan and Meyer, uh, from what little I know of you, that you're not speaking up for Ms. Lee. Well, I think we'll wait till you hear what I say. All right, fine. I think it's important for the American people to understand that the genus 
or AIDS is promiscuous or perverse sex. Any person, any person in America, heterosexual or homosexual, who practices either perverse or promiscuous sex is at increased risk for AIDS. Now, in our society, we've always had moral and ethical reasons for saying to the people of our country that sexuality between humans should be limited to a man and a woman in a monogamous married relationship. That's, that is part of Western civilization. If you choose not to follow the moral and ethical reasons, we now have very personal and public health reasons in this country why each of us should be practicing a personal, monogamous, human sexual relationship. Well, I, I wasn't wrong then, Congressman, when I suggested a moment ago <laughs> that... Wrong about what? That you weren't exactly raising your hand to come out and carry the banner for Ms. Lee and her colleagues. Let's, let's say that... I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, let me, because we have not yet had an opportunity to uh, hear from some of our guests, in Osaka, Japan, is the, is the mayor uh, of San Francisco, uh, Mayor Feinstein, Mayor Feinstein, rather, um, get in on this subject, if you would. How do you feel? Uh, yours is a community which I gather has the second largest number of AIDS patients in the country. Uh, it is known as a city which has been warmly disposed toward the gay community. Um, how do you feel about testing? Voluntary, routine, mandatory? Bring us back to that subject, would you? Well, Ted, very, fr very frankly speaking, I think it's unfortunate that so much of this dialogue revolves around testing because it's not going to solve the problem. What is going to solve the problem is research, is change of lifestyle, is human care. Uh, my city has had about 3,000 AIDS cases and about 2,000 deaths. We started early with a program we're spending about $17 million in the next fiscal year. And frankly, we will be unable to continue the kind of care that's effective without increased help from the federal government. One of the very real problems is that people come from jurisdictions where they can get care. And up to this point, the cities across this nation receive nothing by way of care and I think that's where the dialogue has to come. I think it's unfortunate that when you enter the age, AIDS scene, you do so with a discussion on uh, testing because it's not going to help the problem. We have voluntary testing. You can do limited testing. You can do it on a basis that's anonymous and confidential and not create the kind of fear of isolationism, of job discrimination, of housing discrimination that some of the rhetoric brings with it. Let me, create a, let me create a new problem for you. Actually, it's not that new, and it's one you may have to deal with. Uh, your city, I gather, was toying with the idea of even asking of, of, of being named or cited as a federal disaster area because of AIDS. Uh, obviously, that's not going to be terrific for, for tourism or all the other things that San Francisco is so renowned for, so I gather it is not being done. But what if the federal government comes to you a few weeks down the road and says, Sure, Mayor, we're prepared to give you help. But our price is going to be that you have routine testing or even mandatory testing. What's, what's Mayor Feinstein going to say? Well, first of all, let me correct the record. To my knowledge, we have not toyed as a, as a national disaster area, nor is San Francisco a national disaster area. What San Francisco has done is try to, re to respond forcefully, humanely, and I think very effectively to the problem. As a matter of fact, what we're finding is that fewer people are communicating the disease because of the program we have in effect. Now, with respect to certain kinds of testing, uh, it is being done. It is being done <clears throat> on a voluntary basis. Uh, there are certain kinds of uh, testing that I think um, should be done. I think there should be a, a test, frankly, if you're going to get married, just as a Wasserman test is being given what about when you in enter your a hospital. What about in your when prisons? In prisons? Uh, I frankly think that that's um, not a bad idea uh, either. But what I object to in the testing is that it's proposed in a way that it's going to be a solution. And testing isn't going to be a solution to the disease that everyone's facing. Education and prevention is what really is going to be the solution. And that's where there's no attention 
that I know of from the federal government. Now, you now, have, um, uh, forgive me, and we will come back to you very shortly, but you have, you say, 3,000 cases of AIDS in, in uh, San Francisco? That's correct. The city which has the, the most cases of AIDS, of course, is New York City, which I gather has somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 cases, which creates huge problems. <laughs> Joining us from New York is Dr. Stephen Joseph. He is the New York City Health Commissioner. Uh, let me raise with you, Dr. Joseph, again, the question of testing and how you feel about it, and then we'll move into some other areas. Well, I think uh, I'd associate myself very much with uh, Ma Mayor uh, Feinstein's comments, many of them. Uh, the public health professionals around the country are virtually all in favor of greatly expanded testing, but only in the context of counseling and only if it's confidential, and only if it's a, by voluntary informed consent. But testing is not the answer, just as the mayor uh, has, uh, has said a few moments ago. It's education and counseling and telling people how they can protect themselves, that's the answer. All right, we have at least one international expert with us on this subject, and I would like to go to Washington quickly before we drop the issue of testing, uh, and that is Dr. Jonathan Mann, who is with the World Health Organization. Uh, on the subject of testing, how do you feel, for example, about the notion of testing uh, immigrants or people who are coming into the country? Is there a validity to the, to the idea? Well, the World Health Organization held an expert meeting to review the question of HIV testing for international travelers and concluded that routine testing of international travelers would have no, be no benefit regarding spread of disease, would be extraordinarily expensive, and would detract and take resources away from other more effective programs. In general, regarding testing, WHO feels that it's critical that all of the, of the very complicated issues in testing be addressed whenever testing is considered for any group, for any purpose. And in fact, testing uh, screening is not a simple answer to this complex problem. It's actually a very complicated issue, which can be a part of the answer to this complex problem, but should never be done as a reflex or simple answer. All right, Dr. Mann, thank you. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to have a number of phone calls from around the country, and we will move into some other issues. Back in a moment. Some additional facts. To date, over half of the AIDS cases have been reported in three major cities, New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. But government health officials now project that in four years' time, the disease will be less centered, with 80% of the cases coming from other locations within the nation. And it is from another location in the nation that we now get a phone call from Missouri, I believe. Go ahead, Missouri caller. Hello. Uh, my question is, should we isolate those with AIDS now, or wait until we have to isolate those who are left that do not have AIDS. Well, you've certainly posed a controversial question. Leonard Matlovich, you want to take a whack at it? <clears throat> Let me pass that one right now. All right, Jeff Levy. Well, quarantining isn't going to be a solution to anyone's problem. Uh, and if you want to just talk about it in practical terms, we'd have to quarantine so many people that it would simply be a physical problem. It also just isn't necessary in a society that is committed to respecting some minimal level of civil rights and civil liberties. Every individual can take responsibility for protecting him or herself. You don't need to know the antibody status of another person in order to make sure that you can't become infected. If you're educated about how this disease is transmitted, you can make sure that you don't engage in the kind of behavior that will, trans that will make you receptive to that virus. And therefore, you don't need to quarantine anyone who is carrying the virus. Morgan Fairchild, in this community here in, in Hollywood, California, uh, things must have changed a lot over the last couple of years. Have they, have they changed in terms of the way that people view each other, in terms of the way that people work with each other, in terms, I mean, is it conceivable that someone in this community might say, yes, we really do have to isolate people uh, who have AIDS. We have to get them out of this community. We may, we may be killing the very lifeblood of this society here in Hollywood, which is making films. Which question, Ted? <laughs> Anyone you like. You, you pick one. First of all, I don't think that you'll ever find very many people from the Hollywood community or the New York theater community that would be in favor of any kind of isolation, uh, partially because 
they tend to be a tight-knit group of individuals uh, that work together and that know each other and tend to bother to educate themselves on this issue. Hollywood had to deal with this issue several years ago and I think has adapted uh, several years ago what is now happening in the rest of the country. Uh, I think there was a brief period of panic in town when Rock Hudson became ill and I think it would be very difficult to find anyone in Hollywood at this time that hasn't had friends, close friends, die from the disease. Because of that, because it's, it's a disease that has touched all of us in a very personal way, and because of the camaraderie of the communities, I think what you'll find is that people are very much bonded together in not wanting to isolate somebody and just taking the precautions that education afford. All right, playwright Harvey Firestein is with us in New York. Uh, writes about it, has written about it, acted in, in a couple of his own plays on the subject. Uh, you have lost a lot of friends, a lot of yes. people, that, uh, people who acted in your own play on the subject of homosexuality and AIDS. You have lost some of those people. I mean, do you see it? You're a, uh, you're a man who, who casts a keen eye on this American society of ours. Do you see a day when society at large will say, take those gays and stick them off in a camp somewhere? I think the first thing that we have to really understand is that AIDS is a disease. That is the enemy, not people who have AIDS, not people that are at risk of getting AIDS. It is a disease that's our enemy. That is what we have to educate people about, and that's what we have to address ourselves to. Um, I have lost a lot of friends. I lost two this week alone. Um, it's not easy, but hopefully people will realize that the gay community, who they are now, who certain terrible people are now saying are, are gonna spread the disease to the rest of America, are the people that have taken the first responsibility for the disease, who have raised the money to help people with the disease, and try to raise the consciousness of the rest of the country and the rest of the world. What you're, what you're saying, um, what you're saying clearly strikes a responsive note here among our audience in Los Angeles. Let, let, let me be the one to strike the cynical note. I think it's a little too facile to say that AIDS is the enemy, people who carry AIDS are not. I'm talking now about perceptions, and public perception in this country, as you well know, has a hard time focusing on an invisible disease. That's perception, right. perception causes people to focus on people, and the people who are seen in the eyes of most Americans today as being the carriers of a disease that, is, I mean, that really scares the hell out of people, that's the gay community. Now, I began by asking you, you're a keen observer of the scene, can you see a day when the American society might say, we want to put some of these people away. Put them somewhere where they can't hurt everybody. Let me make a double statement. The first statement is, if there is ever mandatory testing, I will be very happy to be the first person to go to jail for not allowing myself to be tested. <laughs> Secondly, um, if there is a time when we start quarantining gay people, that is when you will really see the spread of AIDS because it is not the out-of-the-closet gay person that spreads AIDS. They have gotten the information. They know what safer sex is. They know how to behave. It is the people that are in the closet that make believe that they're straight, the, the people that, that this sort of perception has pushed back into the closet to the point where they try and control their sexual urges, they control, they control, and then all of a sudden they explode and they do something unsafe. Yeah. And so, if you take people like me, who are out of the closet gays, who have safe sex and a consciousness about gay people and the rest of the world, and the rest, and the concern for all people, and remove us from the society, who's left? but people like that congressman who don't care about people at all. Well, all right. And I think, hold, hold on just a second, Mr. Levy. That, uh, 
that congressman deserves a chance to to at least respond. Go ahead, Congressman Dan Marsh. Well, you know, I'm just looking at a survey uh, conducted by a paper here on the West Coast published at the beginning of 1986 where the question was, favor adding AIDS to the list of diseases that must be quarantined, and 56% of the American people answered that yes, and 44% answered That's lack that of no. And your suggestion, sir, that you can separate uh, the disease uh, from the person is just is ridiculous, to be honest well, with that's you. Lack can't of education. do it. Yes, and we must recognize that one of the primary benefits about testing is we find statistical information on the size of the problem. We need to have that. But also, the benefit of testing is that the individual knows that they have the virus. It's been estimated today is, that 90% of the 2 to 4 million people in this country that have the virus don't even know they have it. And we haven't even as a society established a standard by saying that if you have the virus and you engage in sexual activities with another human, you've committed a crime. We should say that in order to let the people know who have the virus, we're not going to tolerate them transferring this fatal virus to another human. That's I think insanity. That's that is the true insanity. Well, let me, all, let me advise you, sir, that we've had yes. a law in California since 1957 which makes it a misdemeanor for a person with a venereal disease to have sexual relations with another human. Has it ever been used? That's not the point. It's the law. Okay, it's the standard. That's the law. What is right. the law? That's what you people First, do. We let me have let me laws to establish standards that citizens are asked to observe. You pass laws that nobody uses. All right. That's how you make a living. And Mr. Firestein, you make your living by saying things that people can applaud, but that isn't necessarily <laughs> that isn't necessarily and going so to resolve you. the problem for us. Let me let me just do one let me just do one thing here before we before we go to a break. Uh, ABC has has taken a poll, uh, and let me tell you what your fellow citizens believe here. The question is: Should the government test those at high risk? Uh, let me see if you've got the you got the cards up yet. Question that was raised is: Should the U.S. government test those at high risk? And as you can see on your television monitors now, and for those of you who are listening on radio, let me tell you the answer was yes, seventy-two percent; no, twenty-five percent. Ted, can I just then, hold, hold on you? just a second? Let me let me let me finish telling you what some of these what some of these poll results are. Well, uh, uh, but I can the, get scared that you'll go on to another subject, and I won't get to answer this one. All right. Well, go ahead. Let me just say that that is without education. Now you educate people and you don't get test results like that. Well, we're trying to educate people tonight and I hope we will. Well, hey folks, do me a favor. Let's, let's keep the applause down and let's see if we can't go, get through a little more of this material. Let's talk about the poll a little more. Government, okay. should it require mandatory testing for marrying couples, prison inmates, military personnel, entering immigrants? And the answer to all of those questions was yes. Do we have some kind of a yes? By, uh, let me just see, the employer's right to test, yes, 58%, no, 42%, a lot closer. Uh, on the employer's right to test, should workers with AIDS be fired? Now, this is an interesting one because here the tests are, I mean, the, the results are completely opposite. 30% uh, said yes, but a whopping 67% said no. Should students with AIDS be allowed in schools? Uh, this, Mr. Firestein, I think is also going to reassure you a little bit because the answer, 71% said yes, and 27% said no. And finally, here's the question we were leading to, should AIDS sufferers be quarantined at the moment with or without education? The answer of 30% of our fellow citizens is yes, 68% say no. How now, nice. we're going to have to, we'll, we'll come back to you, I promise, right after the uh, commercial break. But we have to take a commercial break right now. We'll be back from Los Angeles in just a moment. Nightline continues live from Los Angeles. Here again is Ted Koppel. With so many passionate people and so many issues to be discussed, we, we, we have a great deal to talk about. And uh, let's first of all clean up where we left off. Harvey Firestein, you, you wanted to make another comment, and then we're going to go out to uh, Osaka, Japan, and Mary Feinstein wants to get in on this. 
Well, that's what I read about not cutting away, because I don't remember what comment I was going to get to. <laughs> so, so go to Mayor Feinstein and come back to me. And maybe you'll think of something, huh? All right, Mayor Feinstein, I hope you haven't forgotten what you wanted to say. Well, no, I haven't, Ted, because uh, I want to approach it for a moment as a mother. And I think what's really important is that we reach out to all of America, the America that's raising children with correct information, with the ability of parents to teach their children, with the ability of effective communities to move uh, very strongly and intelligently to meet the problem. Uh, I really regret because I, I think testing is going to play a role somewhere in this. And I hope it's the health people uh, that devise the methodology because in that way I think uh, the concerns that, that we hear in your audience can be really addressed. But what concerns me the most is out there in America, growing America, the fact that uh, we can no longer be a promiscuous society, that we do have to tell our youngsters uh, what the problem is and give them accurate information. And this is a part I think uh, that's very important has not been addressed on the show, and I would just like to address it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you did, and as a matter of fact, we have uh, Father Bill Wood with us also, who uh, is with the California Catholic Conference. They have just issued a, a pastoral letter on the subject of AIDS, and maybe you would just, uh, first of all, give us a sense of what it was that you said to your community as a whole, uh, and, and uh, how the issue of ethics, morality, religion weaves into all of this. I think especially religion, Ted. Because I think uh, ethics and morality follow only secondarily. Basically, our bishops who, who were very moved by people that they have known who are suffering from the disease of AIDS have challenged the Catholic people to really listen to Jesus Christ and pay attention to what he taught and what he did. And Jesus didn't talk about sex at all. I don't know that Jesus ever used the word. But what Jesus did was look into the eyes of people. And he challenged those who would follow him not to stand in judgment on other people. Let he who was out sin among you throw the first stone. But he said that Almighty God had revealed himself as one who loved especially those who were most vulnerable and that we were to find the presence of God, especially in people who were suffering. And that the Christian response is one of seeing in every person how beautiful they are, how lovable they are, and that the most important starting place before you can talk about testing or before you can talk about education even, is to recognize the transcendent beauty and value of each human person. And that persons who are suffering are actually the presence of God in this world suffering and that what we are called to is compassion and unconditional love. We have found Vicki Mays and Vicki Mays for our radio audience is a UCLA psychologist who focuses on the problem of AIDS in minorities and among women, children we have found that uh, somehow perhaps we are focusing too much on the most visible groups and we are not focusing in in a sense to uh, to use ralph ellison's old title uh, black people with aids have become the invisible man and the, and the invisible woman again haven't they i think that the focus has been to kind of blame black americans in terms of having aids we look at them as predominantly getting AIDS because of drug abuse, and we say, ah, 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 if you hadn't used drugs, then you would not have AIDS. When we do that, I think what we do is we miss a very significant um, social and psychological point. Uh, we've been looking at individuals as being infection vectors, and we haven't been looking at what were the antecedents that led up to AIDS in the first place. Why is there drug abuse? Uh, why is it that um, blacks wait so long to go in for health care when they have AIDS? Uh, part of the problem is there's poor health care, there's poverty, uh, there is drug addiction. And, you know, what we do is we look at the numbers and say that black Americans are at fault. Talk to me about the numbers for a moment. They are disproportionately high, are they not? 
When we look at the, the overall statistics, what we see is that of all the cases, black Americans represent about 25% of those cases. Um, if what you do is realize how many blacks there are in this country in comparison to whites in this country, what you then see is that AIDS is actually about three times more prevalent um, in, in the black population. Um, and if we look at the numbers, when we start breaking them down even finer and talking about gender, what you find is that 51% of women that get AIDS are black. And when you start talking about the children, then it, it, it's a tragedy. I mean, the numbers are even higher again. And like I said, there are a lot of social conditions that impact upon AIDS that we have yet to look at. A high percentage, as you have just heard, of AIDS victims to date are black and Hispanic, but the question is why? Health reporter Diana Davis of ABC affiliate WSB in Atlanta has a report for us. AIDS. This is the face of the disease most of us see, a gay white man. The disease struck them first, but some researchers say it's now spreading like wildfire to minorities, burning its way through black and Hispanic communities. Of the more than 35,000 cases of AIDS reported so far, 40% are among blacks and Hispanics an alarming rate considering they make up only 18% of the population. The Centers for Disease Control say most AIDS cases among minorities are traced to IV drug abuse, contaminated needles spreading the virus. This raid on an Atlanta shooting gallery turned up tables littered with dirty needles. Junkies share them, pass the virus to each other and to their women. This mother of four, who doesn't want to be identified, got AIDS from her husband, who's a junkie. She says the problem is worse among the poor. Because a lot of people are there all day with nothing to do. Just have a lot of sex and think that they're safe or, you know, use drugs. And here's a booklet here. If you have any questions about AIDS, or do you know that much about it? Atlanta's street team for AIDS Risk Reduction, STAR for short, is trying to reach out to minorities at risk for AIDS. Sterling White beat an 18-year addiction to IV drugs. Now he and partner Jeff Cornett work for the state, bringing the message of AIDS prevention to streets a stone's throw from notorious neighborhood drug houses. And what we're doing is trying to uh, let people know about the safe IV drug use practice of washing your, you know, your syringes out and not sharing needles with people. The talk is explicit, basic street language. The message is clear. AIDS is colorblind, no longer confined to white gay men. Misconceptions are strong. A lot of them just aren't even aware that it's affecting them at all. A lot of times people don't realize I'm at risk for AIDS so they know someone that dies. And unfortunately, by that time, they may already be infected. With no cure, no vaccine for AIDS in sight, the experts say prevention is the only hope of slowing the AIDS wildfire and the message on the streets may slowly be getting through. You know, it used to be IV drug users. Now, nah, I don't want to hear about AIDS. I'm not interested. Now they know somebody that died or they, they've heard about it, and they're coming to us and say, tell us about AIDS. I'm Diana Davis, WSB-TV in Atlanta for Nightline. Some additional facts. AIDS is not restricted to the adult population. As of June 1st, 1987, 504 cases of children with AIDS had been reported to the Center for Disease Control. 322 children have died. It is estimated that in four years, 4,000 babies will have contracted the disease while in their mother's wombs. And we are back live again in California. Carol Lee, uh, you had something you wanted to say on the subject. Of, uh... Yes, um, about black women and mandatory testing. Um, according to statistics, prosti black prostitutes compromise uh, less than 50%, probably 20 to 30% of the, the to total of prostitutes. Yet 85% of those who are jailed and sentenced are black women. And when we're talking about mandatory testing of convicted prostitutes, we may be talking about te mandatory testing of black women, and, and we're very alarmed about that. Vicki Mays, any, any comments or thoughts on that? I think that, uh, that was, I, I knew that fact, but I wasn't sure whether or not we wanted to actually talk about prostitutes. One of the things that um, I think that we face in terms of black Americans is the issue of when, if there is mandatory testing, they will be affected to the greatest extent. Because what we're going to do is if people come in for drug abuse counseling, uh, if people come in to use um, prenatal services, 
typically black Americans will tend to use county state facilities. There will be identification, and from that identification there will be problems that will result. So when you're talking about poor people that have to use services where identification is going to be a major factor, they are going to be severely impacted upon by something like mandatory testing. All right, Leonard Matlevich, and then I want, to go to a, I want to go to a number of phone calls. Go ahead. Well, I'm actually angry now. You know, we've been on the show for an hour and a half, and we keep getting back to testing, testing, testing. Uh, the Surgeon General's report, the National Academy of Science report, if this administration, the Reagan administration, would simply do what its chief doctors and its scientists have said, we, will, we won't be running on this merry-go-round about testing. It is not the solution. We need to move on. We need leadership from the Reagan White House to get this nation away from death camps and testing and on to finding a cure and educating people so no one else gets this disease. All right, first of all, the only person who's been talking about camps of any kind, and we certainly weren't talking about death camps, was me. No one else has talked well, about them yet. To the best of my knowledge, Congressman, were you talking about camps at all? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but, I have uh, made no such statement about them at all. Okay, fine. Uh, the thing, then, about, then, the thing about camps, you know, let's, right. no, no camps. Right, but, but the congressman what? did support Proposition 64 that would have involved quarantine. And maybe, maybe I can respond to that. The only thing Prop 64 would have done in the state of California would have made those with the virus reportable. That's all it did. There are a lot of people in this state who said other things about it who should be ashamed of themselves quite candidly, including some of my good friends serving in the California Medical Association who unfortunately misrepresented what Prop 64 would do All to right. a lot of people in this let me, let me jump in and just make a quick point because we're going to have to go for another break. When we come back, we're going to have some more phone calls. I also want to get into a subject very much in the news today. We haven't even touched on it yet. Terribly important, insurance health insurance, life insurance, and the degree to which insurance will be available to people who test positive for AIDS. We'll come to our phone calls and that subject when we return. AIDS, a national town meeting, will continue in a moment. just tell you that what you're seeing right now is not, uh, unless you're hoping the end of the, the program, all we're doing is giving our television viewers and our, our radio listeners should know that we are seeing a crawl go by uh, of some of the names of the panelists uh, who are with us tonight, some of whom have not yet, even though we've been on the air for an hour and a half, had a chance to, uh, to join us in this discussion. Uh, also chafing at the bit are, uh, I'm afraid, thousands of telephone callers uh, only a very few of whom are going to get through, and our very patient audience here in Los Angeles, some of whom will also be getting on the air very, very soon. Uh, let's go to a couple of phone calls. We have one from California. Yes, if you are an IV drug user and you don't show your needles, are you still in a high risk factor? All right, Tim Johnson. You're at high risk if you, if, if you don't share a needle, no, I guess not. If you use a sterile needle or you can guarantee that the needle is not contaminated, you would not be in a high-risk group. Uh, I guess that's the best way I can answer. That's easy. Quick question, quick answer. Let's can go to... Comment? Yeah, please. Uh, who can wanted make to make a comment? Yes, that? go ahead. Vicky, think, Vicky Mays. Yes, rather than talking about just a high-risk group, the question is, does that individual engage in any high-risk behaviors? How do you mean? For instance, what type of sexual activities does that person engage in? Um, who is that person's sexual partner? No, I, I understand that, but I think the thrust of the question was plain and simply, do you, by virtue of being an IV drug user, increase your chances of getting AIDS? Uh, and, uh, and in terms of that activity alone, not unless you use a contaminated needle. All right, but I think fine. the important uh, point there was activity uh, rather than group, because uh, as long as we, as we keep classifying people as being in risk groups, we won't overcome the denial that so many people have. There are activities that place you at risk. The fact that you are homosexual does not necessarily place you in, at risk. It is the kind of act, unprotected activity that you might engage in that is risky, whether it is homosexual or heterosexual, similarly with IV drug use. All right, that was Jeff Levy. Now, um, folks, it really isn't necessary to applaud everything you approve of and hiss and boo when you hear something you disapprove of. Let's, let's go to a question from our audience here. Go ahead, man. I'm Carlene Bridgman, the Executive Director of Home Support Services here in Los Angeles. We take care of people very ill and people dying at home rather than in the hospital. Several of the patients that we've taken care of are AIDS patients. My concerns as a nurse 
and concerns that we have as medical professionals. What is our vulnerability to exposure to the AIDS virus? And will, be we, will we be considered a high-risk group? All right, Dr. Anthony Fauci of the National Institute of Health, uh, would you be good enough to answer that question for us? Yes, certainly uh, uh, health care providers are not high-risk group. Um, health care providers have a finite risk that's very, very small. If you look at the actual data, the statistics, the numbers of the thousands of health care workers that have been followed over the past several years and the hundreds of needle stick injuries that have occurred and splash injuries to the mucosal surfaces, the chances of getting infected with HIV from a contaminated needle that you stick yourself with or a splash injury is less than a fraction of a percent. The risk is real, but it's very, very small. And because of that, we should not consider healthcare workers as being in a risk group. Certainly, they don't practice risk behavior. Taking care of patients with AIDS is not a risk behavior. While we're on the subject, though, Dr. Fauci, you know in the last couple of weeks there was the case of the three healthcare workers who apparently contracted AIDS because they were splashed with blood from an AIDS, uh, uh, well, I, I don't know where the blood came from, but apparently they had open sores on their hands or uh lips face I'm, I'm not quite clear on the details can you explain how that happened and and whether yes, that for, whether that sort of thing is simply carelessness or a function of the job well first of all they didn't contract aids they they became seropositive which means they're infected with the virus they don't have aids again if you look at all of the individuals who are exposed as healthcare workers even though these three uh, had some publicity because of the fact that there were three reported at once it's still a very rare event. You can cut down on that type of thing if you practice the precautionary procedures that are recommended by the Public Health Service. But I don't think you can say that those three health care providers were careless and it's their fault. A lot of times in emergency situations, even though you know what the correct procedures are, it's very difficult to follow them. So I don't think that we should look in any way in a disparaging way that they may have been careless I think they should be commended for putting themselves on the line and taking care of patients. All right, another can phone call. Can uh, I, may I add something to that? Yes, please. Who, I'm sorry. Where, where are you coming Lin from? Linda Lampkin. Linda um, Lampkin. May I introduce you first of all, Linda Lampkin, because uh, your voice has not yet been heard by our right. radio audience. Uh, Linda Lampkin is with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, uh, and her specialty is AIDS in the workplace. Please. Yes, we represent about 300,000 health care workers across the nation, including home health care workers, as well as hospital uh, workers, those in mental health institutions, and, of course, another area is uh, prisons. We represent a lot of prison guards, so our members are very concerned about this. Uh, we've done a lot of education activities. Uh, we are working very hard to raise the level of awareness of our health care workers and people who might be exposed. Uh, at the moment, there are no requirements for any kind of uh, education requirements or protective equipment at all in the workplace. There are recommended guidelines, and we feel that these latest three exposures of healthcare workers, uh, which is a lot, uh, three people got it, uh, and it was a much more incidental exposure than it had been thought in the past. Before, everybody thought it was massive amounts of blood or uh, a lot of uh, contact with bodily fluid. So these three cases are very important to us. We think that healthcare workers should be a focus for education and a focus for the provision of equipment uh, such as rubber gloves, uh, mask gowns, in, in these cases where precautions need to be taken. And again, there are no regulations requiring this right now. We have petitioned OSHA for an emergency standard on this and have not yet received a response. Dr. Vomiting? Uh, just quickly, I'd, I'd stress what Tony Fauci said, which is that the risk while, while present is extremely low. We've been very concerned about this at San Francisco General where we're taking care of hundreds of AIDS patients. We've responded by educating our staff and by testing ourselves for the, for the antibody, for the virus. What we found is that none of our staff without other risk factors have gotten infected, even though we take care of hundreds of patients. And we think that's a, an important point to, to get across, that education reasonable precautions can can prevent this kind of transmission who should generate that that educational drive now clearly at san francisco general it has come from what the administration of the hospital 
very cooperative relationship between the administration, the medical staff, and the employees, uh, and including the representation from the union. Right. We've we worked well together. We are going to take another phone call from California. Go ahead, California. Hello? Go ahead. Um, I work in a small community, at, work in a dental practice, and I'm really concerned about how concerned we should be wearing gloves and masks. And if it's really critical, um, why don't they have a mandatory thing that says that all dental employees should wear gloves and masks? <laughs> May I ask what kind of activity you're involved in? Because I think if you've been listening to the program for the last few minutes, you will hear that, you know, depending on what kind of uh, activity you're involved in, clearly you should wear um, a, a mask or you should wear protective gloves. I'm in uh, chair side assisting, and I agree that we should probably wear gloves. But it is kind of at the discretion of the employer at this moment. And it's whether he thinks that we should wear gloves or masks. And, um, and and so what are you asking, whether whether in fact employers, I mean, uh, whether it's hospitals or whether it's in a smaller facility should make it mandatory? I mean, clearly, if you wanted to, you could, right? Well, we could, except sometimes it's not really convenient to wear a mask and gloves eight hours a day when you're doing chair side, and sometimes you're doing office work, and you come out, you do office work, you take off your gloves, you take off your mask. And some people in this town really think that if you put on gloves and a mask that you think they're a disease and i'm just concerned over the idea that if uh, it's real critical that we wear these and i know other offices that do and other offices that don't then they should make it mandatory when you're doing any kind of dental surgery for your own sake and for the well-being of the patient. All right, Dr. Fauci, uh, in Washington, there, there was a case today, and forgive me, some of this is a little unclear in my mind, but there was a case today in New York. a dentist in New York, I guess, who, who apparently has contracted the, uh, uh, the virus. I don't know how he got it. Would you explain it to us? Yeah, what happened is that they did a survey of approximately 1,200 dentists who voluntarily filled out a questionnaire and gave blood for antibody testing. Uh, these individuals were not in, in practicing known risk behavior. One of the dentists turned out to be antibody positive. So the question is, had that person gotten it from a patient? Now, it's very well known that dentists not infrequently nick their fingers or, or stick their fingers with needles as they're administering the anesthetic or what have you. Again, this underscores the need for care. The case had not been completely worked up, but it is not surprising if you have dentists over a thousand, of which many, many of them are pricking their finger or cutting themselves, particularly a lot of them who don't wear gloves, that you would have a single conversion. It underscores what we've just been saying over the past few minutes. There's a finite risk, and if you take care, you may even cut down the risk more than that small risk already is. So now, I'm not surprised at that. Let me turn the question around. Uh, I'm a patient. I'm going off to, to, to see this dentist. Uh, and maybe the dentist, for, you know, for some reason or another, has AIDS. And if he pricks his finger and he's not wearing uh, surgical gloves, presumably he could communicate it to me if he's working in my mouth and there's, there's an open sore or an open wound in my mouth, correct? That's quite correct. So, what, so what? To, 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 to kind of square the circle here with what the, uh, the caller was asking a moment ago, should it be required then that people in situations like that wear surgical masks, wear gloves? Well, if an individual is seropositive and is in fact dealing with mucosal surfaces or what have you of other individuals, th that person should wear gloves. All right. It's happened more than once now that a medical professional has contracted AIDS. Should such people continue to practice in their field? Marianne Childers of ABC station WLS in Chicago looks at one case in her community, the case of a physician practicing at Chicago's largest public hospital. Most patients at Cook County Hospital are poor or indigent, and according to the Illinois Department of Health, the people who have the least knowledge and greatest fear of AIDS. Last February, when it was learned that a doctor on the staff here had AIDS, he was ordered to stop seeing patients. When he refused, medical director Agnes Latimer suspended him. The perception by the community that they were possibly going to be cared for 
by a provider who, who might have a communicable and usually fatal disease. We, with this perception, we felt there would be such a high level of anxiety that many people might decide not to come for necessary care. Latimer was following orders from the Cook County Board, 17 elected officials who run County Hospital. The suspension outraged doctors. It's our job not to reflect back at the public its own fears, but to lead the public so that the fears that they have are appropriately adjusted to the risk that exists. Doctors argued that since the physician with AIDS was closely following guidelines set by the Centers for Disease Control, he posed no threat to patient health or safety. Among other things, those guidelines call for the use of gloves and gowns and recommend against so-called invasive procedures such as surgery or drawing blood because of the danger of accidental injury. The red-hot controversy triggered a barrage of bureaucratic red tape. Three hospital committees, dominated by doctors, voted to reinstate the physician with full privileges. In an unprecedented action, experts from Chicago's major medical centers and the heads of the state, the county, and the city health departments urged the board to act on the medical facts and not on fear. But board members saw the issue differently. The doctors here are in a, in a small group in a little ivory tower. How do they know what's happening out in, as far as the public perception is? And one thing we don't want to do is to have people not come to the hospital. We don't want to wreck the reputation. If we're going to err, let's err in favor of the patient. If we have a judgment against us for employment discrimination of $100,000, that's nothing compared to the judgment we're going to have if some patient contracts AIDS from a doctor who is a carrier. And one week later, despite the overwhelming recommendations of the hospital's own staff, the board again suspended the doctor's patient privileges, restricting him to research and lab work and supervising medical staff. Harvey Grossman is an attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union who's representing the doctor. It's what this says is that casual contact can spread AIDS. That flies in the face of everything that we know. Indeed, if this order has any integrity, uh, everybody better avoid getting uh, on a bus and accepting change from a waitress or a cashier or having any casual contact with anybody. Under the hospital bylaws, the restrictions don't take effect until the doctor's had a chance to appeal. That process has been going on for three months now, and he's been seeing patients here every day with no problem. But many people, including the doctor's attorneys, believe the board will never reverse its decision. And they're preparing to take the case to federal court. They say much more is at stake than the rights of just one doctor. Overly repressive, unnecessary action against healthcare providers with AIDS will have the effect of driving healthcare workers who have AIDS underground. We won't know they're there. Uh, and if they are careless and aren't following procedures uh, promulgated by the Centers for Disease Control and other responsible bodies, they may in fact pose a threat to the public safety. Mary Ann Childers, WLS-TV in Chicago for Nightline. Some additional facts. Based on an average survival time of 18 months from diagnosis to death, the medical care for each AIDS patient can cost between fifty and $150,000 with 270,000 cases projected in four years time the public health service estimates medical care costs reaching 16 billion dollars this special edition of nightline live from los angeles will continue in a moment Let me just refresh the memories of those of you who are listening on radio, and we will put the numbers up again for those of you who are watching on television. Uh, these are the toll-free numbers by which you can reach us. In California, you should call 1-800-227-8234. That's 1-800-227-8234. And the rest of the country has only one number. That is 1-800-624-7564. That number is one 800 624-7564, which tells you something about the disproportionate influence of California in this country. Along with its social and political consequences, AIDS will have a major impact on our economy as well. Among those gearing up for that impact are the nation's insurance companies. Bill Butel of our station WABC in New York reports on the controversy that's created. 
Yeah, you look great. He'll tell you just what you want to hear. But what he can't tell you is if he's got the AIDS virus. So protect yourself. Use a condom. No one pays as much for this disease we call AIDS as the victim. But the insurance industry pays, too. An estimated $10 billion by 1992. So the New York Life Insurance Company helped pay for these public service commercials, part of their response to the issue of AIDS. But the insurance industry has also responded by sometimes refusing to insure those who have AIDS or who test positive for the AIDS virus or who just live a life that makes them a likely victim of AIDS. Is a man single? Does he live in a section of the city known for its homosexual population? Is the beneficiary of his policy someone other than a spouse or a child? All those things can trigger an applicant's rejection. Take the case of Robert. An insurance agent wanted to sell this single New Yorker a disability policy. And I said, I am gay. I don't want to have to uh, submit a blood sample to the insurance company. I don't want to have to go through a special physical. And I asked him, would I have to go through any of this? And he said, oh, absolutely not. Robert agreed to buy the policy, paid a two-month premium. But then the agent called him and said they did want a blood sample. And I said, wait a minute. Uh, what do they want the blood sample for? And he gets back on the phone with me. He says, they won't tell me. <laughs> I said, you've got to be kidding. That's outrageous. I really don't believe that the sexual orientation of the applicant uh, enters into the underwriting process. What does enter in is the, is the man's health. Malcolm Mackay is senior vice president of the New York Life Insurance uh, Company. And we are um, seeing a great increase in... Uh, policies being taken out shortly before somebody uh, uh, dies of AIDS. And that is, the, that is a real problem for us. The insurance companies say the cost of treating AIDS patients could put them out of business. Individual care for an AIDS patient from beginning to end ranges from a conservative $40,000 up to $150,000. Uh, we simply are not big enough, the entire industry is not big enough, uh, to pay for what I think is going to be the total cost of, of this AIDS epidemic. Well, no one's asking the insurance in industry to be the financer of people who are ill. Um, but the point is that insurance isn't just insurance. It is access to health care for millions of Americans. To guarantee that access, New York State is considering a new bill that would prohibit the insurance industry from giving the AIDS test to people who want to buy health insurance. That could cost the industry. There are a half million people here who would test positive, and at least a third of those will eventually get AIDS. What would happen to the insurance companies if they could not reject those people who are likely to get AIDS? Well, it, it, would, it, it would cause us to, to go bankrupt. But the insurance industry and gay rights groups agree, no matter who pays for the moment, all of us, one way or another, will eventually bear the financial cost of AIDS. This is Bill Butel, WABC New York, for Nightline. Some additional facts. These people were a tremendous loss to the country. Over 47,000 Americans killed during the Vietnam War. But in four years' time, 54,000 Americans are expected to die each year from AIDS. I'd like now to introduce you to another of our panelists from whom we have not yet heard. Dr. Robert Gleason is with Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance and is an expert on the subject of AIDS. You've become one over the last few months that you've been, last few years, I guess, that last you've been focusing years. on it. Um, is it true that an insurance that the insurance companies in general may choose not to give life insurance to someone simply because of lifestyle, not because they've tested him, but because, well, he lives in a part of town uh, in which a lot of gays live, or he lives in a part of town in which there may be a lot of drug users? That what is not true. We do not use lifestyle, geography, sexual orientation uh, in our underwriting. Now, what about blood tests? We do do blood tests for, on two bases. The first is an age and amount limit, where a company sets uh, a rule which will say that anyone applying for insurance of a certain age and wanting a certain amount has to have a blood test. No what, ifs, ands, or buts. What age, what amount? Uh, it varies with companies. Some companies, the testing limit today is as high as a million dollars. Other companies, it's as low as $100,000. Is the, is the amount coming down? The amount is coming down. So in other words, the, the insurance companies are trying to reduce the risk by saying, we'll, we'll sell you insurance, but not as much insurance as we would have sold you a while ago if you refuse to take a test. That is correct. And we're doing that because we have seen very strong evidence that people who 
are infected are buying insurance in excess amounts and their deaths are occurring uh, with a striking tendency toward the first couple of years of the policy. Now, what? some have argued that we have the right to contest claims in the first two years, but it's very difficult to be successful in contesting a death claim in a court of law. We've got a couple of questions from our audience here, but before we get to those, I'd just like to ask you, when you say in striking numbers or striking percentages, give me a comparative sense. Okay. 42% of all death claims for three major companies in the country, and it's consistent in all companies. 42% of all AIDS death claims have occurred in the first two years. Uh, we expect less than 10% of our death claims to occur in the first two years. Now, while 30% difference does not strike us as a tremendously huge number, to an actuary who begins to look at the significance of that number over the next 10 or 20 years, the difference becomes huge. Put a, put a dollar figure on this. What, do, what does the insurance industry project that it is going to have to start paying uh, if indeed it continues to insure people with, with AIDS? I cannot give you a figure for the industry, so I'll give you a figure for my own company. Because we do pay on existing health, life, and disability claims as an industry. They're in force. We're going to pay them. Uh, our company, Northwestern Mutual, will pay a total of $100 million in death claims by the end of the year 1991. Compared to how much this year? Uh, this last year, we paid $4.5 million in AIDS-related death claims. All right, Jeff Levy, now, any, can I any, put that in perspective? I, I, I'll tell you what. Let me just, we'll come back to you, but I, I, I want to get okay. a sense from Jeff Levy. Uh, these sound like terribly compelling statistics when you hear them reel by, and that's why I wanted to give Dr. Gleason a chance to, to, to reel them off. Do you have any problem with them? Um, I, I'm not sure that I dispute any of the figures. I, I think I do dispute the question as to whether or not, if an insurance company wanted to, they could contest a claim that occurred within the first or first year or two, because there are. That's why contestability clauses are put in there. Well, I mean, do you do you acknowledge, for example, that an insurance company, which is after all a, a business and a very profitable one too, has a right to try to weed out those people who know that they're. I mean, for example, Leonard Matlovich, you've got AIDS. You know you're going to die within how long a year a year uh if if you were if if you were in a position for example to go out and buy insurance buy a large life insurance policy uh and leave it not even to a family member or to friends leave it to the you know to to the aids cause i mean to to the cause of research into aids you'd probably do it but does the insurance company have an obligation to insure you knowing that you're going to die in a year yeah, you know, I, I don't think the insurance companies in this country can have it both ways. They lobby in Congress to prevent uh, national health care. And they say, we will provide the health of America. And now they're saying, well, we'll only provide the health of America if you're well. So maybe they should go out of business and maybe we should have national health care. <laughs> You, you really you really want that? You well, think, Jeff well, Levy, uh, that you... I mean, would you, would you like I, to have a situation in which we have national health care? A lot of countries around the world have got it, not through well, the Well, to be perfectly honest, I think, first of all, we need to make a distinction between life insurance and health insurance, and I think Bob would agree with that. Uh, but personally, I wouldn't mind having a system of national health insurance. And in fact, one of the things we saw at the international conference is that in the United States, aid service organizations spend a disproportionate amount of their time worrying and helping people with AIDS in terms of paying for health care. And we're the only country in the Western world, save South Africa, uh, that does not have some form of national health insurance. And so therefore, we are having to worry about how we're going to pay for the care that people need, rather than focusing on delivering that care. Right. Hold on, hold but, on one second, if you would, because I'd like to bring in a, a caller from Kentucky. Kentucky caller, can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead and ask your question, please. Okay. Um... This is kind of based on a national insurance policy. I'd like to see it, but basically because AIDS research and health care is so extremely high and most patients can't afford it or can't get a medical card until they're almost dead. Uh, in this state, you can't get it for a family of two. If you make over $280 a month, you're cut off totally. Um, that every working American has 5 or $10 taken out of their paycheck by the government and have that money earmarked for research 
education and the bulk of that money going for health care services to AIDS victims because, you know, somebody with Liberace's resources wouldn't need it, but the average person with it does. And, and what would you recommend be done with insurance companies? I mean, do you, do you think insurance companies have any kind of an obligation to continue providing uh, health care benefits or to continue insuring people who may, who may come down with AIDS or who may have it? Well, most insurance companies, because I've been trying to find an insurance policy for my son and myself, will not cover pre-existing conditions. Uh, if you've got AIDS, they're not going to cover you. Uh, now, if you have an insurance policy for five or six years and you're diagnosed with AIDS, uh, they better cover you. I feel that they should. But there's many Americans out there that do not have proper health care benefits or enough income or benefits insurance-wise to cover that type of situation. A lot of insurance policies give a cutoff on, on treatment amounts that they will not exceed a certain amount or they will not um, treat you until you've made a particular payment of $2,000 or $5,000 and then they'll pick up, you know, 100%. I am in a family situation. I'm a single head of household making bare, not even quite 12000 a year. I cannot afford $2,000 deductible for myself or my son. I would have to go without treatment. Let, in let me let me in financial trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what I'd like to do is go to New York and Dr. Stephen Joseph, who is the New York City Health Commissioner. There's a city that is facing unbelievable financial problems and is going to face even worse financial problems and is going to face even greater problems in terms just of the number of beds that you have available in that city. Uh, talk to that point. Talk to the insurance point, if you would, Dr. Joseph. Well, that's correct, Ted. We have now, <clears throat> on any given day, a thousand people in hospital beds in New York City at somewhere around seven hundred or eight hundred dollars uh, a bed day that's already an enormous number by 1991 uh, we'll have forty thousand four zero thousand uh, cumulative cases of AIDS and the numbers just go up and up I think I'd have to agree with the point that we have to make a difference between health insurance and life insurance and I do believe that uh, AIDS may finally be the thing that pushes this country into a rational system of national health insurance. Clearly, we have got to find a way to underwrite the costs of, uh, of health care of the people who need it very most. And those are uh, people with uh, AIDS and AIDS-related conditions. All right, we have a... Well, Tim Johnson, I'm sorry, you wanted to make a point? Go ahead. I would simply point out that obviously the long-term solution is going to be to find a cure for the problem. In the short term, I think we can work harder than we now are at finding less costly forms of health care in a lot of diseases, including AIDS. I'm sure Paul would tell us that many of the people who are cared for now in the hospital could be well cared for in much less expensive settings. And I think we're going to have to turn our attention to that kind of care, hospice-type care, intermediate-type care, to avoid the expense of hospital care. Uh, Paul Volbeding and, and then Nancy yeah, Merritt. We've uh, obviously, They're Tim, we, we agree. We, uh, we've worked hard at, in San Francisco on developing a, a comprehensive system of care that really was designed to be comprehensive and socially sensitive to the patients we were seeing. It ended up being cost effective, and the, and the, the real key is to focus on community based care, using the agencies, using the volunteer groups working on uh, insurance policies to, to make sure that the reimbursement for those services is adequate. Focusing on, on reducing the time that the patients have to spend in the hospital is, is the most effective way we see to, to reduce the cost. All right, let me just introduce another, uh, another guest from whom we haven't heard yet. Nancy Merritt is with the Bank of America, uh, and the focus of her expertise is AIDS in the workplace. Give us, if you would, Ms. Merritt, just a, a quick thought or two on this subject, because I want to get to our audience here, and we'll come back to you then after the break. Go ahead. Yes, I wanted to add from our own personal experience what we found, and I think it is key looking at alternative methods of care. Um, we use case management at Bank of America, which means that we individualize the treatment for any kind of catastrophic illness, and that looks at home care hospice. When you look at home care costs, it's about 100 to $300 a day versus inpatient acute kind of hospitalization, which is about $880 to $1,000. When you add case management with job accommodation, working with the employee to work as long as they can in the workplace, plus prevention, 
What we found is employees with AIDS, our average case costs for health insurance has been about $17,000. Let me stop you right there. We have a phone call from Ohio that is relevant to what we've been talking about. Go ahead, Ohio. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't want to sound like a terrible person, but uh, I'm a heart patient who can't get life insurance because of that fact. And I'm trying to find out why uh, AIDS patients who test positive should be able to get life insurance because of that. Well, uh, it may be that AIDS patients who, who test positive are not going to. I mean, uh, Bob Gleason, let's get back to that subject. Uh, how long is it going to be before insurance companies around this country say, A, you've got to have a blood test. B, if you test positive, we're not going to insure you. We're not going to give you any kind of insurance. I don't know that we'll reach the point where we say that we require the test for all types of insurance and all amounts. But unfortunately, being infected with the AIDS virus poses such a tremendous threat to your health that you're about five to ten times higher than our upper limit of insurability. For example, the standard mortality for a given age is, uh, let's call person age 35. We expect one death per thousand people per year. If that person is a smoker, we expect two deaths per thousand per year. If that person has diabetes, we expect on the average four deaths per thousand per year. If that person is an asymptomatic HIV reactive person, using the federal numbers of 20% death rate over five years, that's 200 deaths over five years or 40 deaths per year per thousand people. And that our upper limit of insurability is about six or seven deaths per thousand per year. We're going we're gonna to pick up. Jeff Levy, uh, I'll come back to you in a moment. We also have a couple of, of questions here in the, in the hall on the same subject. We have to take a break. When we come back, we're going to pick up on the subject of insurance. We'll be back from Los Angeles in a moment. If you need additional information on AIDS or have a specific question, you can call the National AIDS Hotline at 800-342. Once again, if you require some additional information about AIDS or have a specific question, that number for the National AIDS Hotline is 800-342-2437. And we are back live in Los Angeles, and we're going to pick up exactly where we left off on the subject of insurance. We have a couple of uh, questions here in our live audience. Go ahead, sir. My name is Rick Talona, and I'm from the Los Angeles area. I'm in the healthcare industry, and what we're seeing is several doctors and hospitals taking, they're starting to refuse the indigent and the Medi-Cal patients. What they're getting put into is a second-rate healthcare system, which you or I have the luxury of having good insurance, and something needs to be done about this in the name of national health. It's time for Congress to get off their butts and do it now. Now, uh, before you go away, relate that now to me. In, in other words, are you saying we're, we're focusing too much? Walk the hospital sometimes. Yeah, but I mean, uh, no, 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 I'm, I'm not arguing with you. I'm right. trying to understand what it is you're saying. Uh, e explain to me how that relates now to the question of AIDS care. Of AIDS care? Yeah. Okay. If you have health insurance, you have private physicians who can usually take care of you. If you have no insurance or Medi-Cal, doctors aren't getting paid from Medi-Cal. They don't want to see them or they, you know, are hesitant to see them, they're not going to get the care that they actually deserve. And these people need the best care they can possibly get. All right, now we are talking about the indigent, Jeff Levy and Vicki Mays. I'd like you both to comment on that, and then Congressman will, will come to you. Jeff? I think, Ted, it's really, we've talked a lot about life insurance, and it's really health insurance that is the critical issue. I think the dis point of disagreement over life insurance focuses primarily on the fact that if a life insurance company tests for HIV antibodies, that record will also be shared with health insurance companies. And similarly, whether it's life or health, the price of insurance should not be the potential loss of a job or, or other basic things that we need to protect people from discrimination on. Insurance is not just an industry in this country, it's also a social good. And I think as this gentleman pointed out just now, health insurance guarantees us access to quality care. We can't look at this issue in a vacuum as simply a business decision or an actuarial decision by the insurance companies. 
The government has to participate. There's no doubt in my mind that there's a tremendous financial burden being borne either by the private health insurers or by employers who are self-employed. But we have to start looking at imaginative solutions, guaranteeing confidentiality of test results, guaranteeing non-discrimination, and creating risk pools or some kind of mechanism. And I think in addition to the people who are sitting in Los Angeles on this panel talking about health care costs and how important it is to address that issue, perhaps we should also ask Dr. Uh, Gary Bauer uh, what the White House plans to do on the subject, because that is the one area where I think the, the administration has been most painfully silent. They've debated testing, they've debated e research, they've debated education. They simply haven't addressed the issue of health care costs. And as Dr. Joseph can say, and as others here can say, that's the, the train that's coming at us at 100 miles an hour, and no one's doing anything to put the brakes on. I must excuse uh, Gary Bauer, because he has a, a personal health problem with a member of his family and had to leave us early, so he is not able to respond. And I'm not quite sure who on, on this panel is. Congressman, do you, you, you want to try and address it? I'd like the, to. The notion of national, the notion of national health care for those, who, I mean, we are going to have more and more people Dead who simply arson. cannot afford, yeah. particularly if the insurance companies can't pay for it, to take care of themselves. Who is going to take care of it? Our society has said that we will make any medical service in America available to any person on the perceived need of the provider independent of the ability of the recipient to pay. As a public policy, we've said that. We've gone down this road for the last 20 years. But the problem that we're encountering today very candidly is we're not sure we can afford that. Rising state expenditures for health care, rising federal costs for health care, are at an all-time high in this country and quite candidly what's happening is that the government the state government of california many state governments are saying <coughs> we must cap what we're paying for medical costs if there's to be a stop in taxes that people in our society have to pay that means in some instances the state government is not willing to pay the bill costs that are being charged by hospitals for patient care under medical and some hospitals are saying, since you're not, state of California, since you're not paying us what it's costing us, we're no longer going to treat Medi-Cal patients. It is a true crisis in our society. I don't know, there's no easy answer to it. But I think uh, the gentleman over here, Dr. Johnson, is absolutely right. We're going to have to develop a different strategy for caring for the tragic victims of this disease because, frankly, I don't think we can afford to continue to give them intensive care treatment uh, to the extent we have previously. Father Bill Wood, bring, bring not just your church, bring religion in general back into this, bring the, the subject of charity into this. You were talking about charity uh, about an hour or so ago. Uh, what's happening? In, is, is there any chance that charitable contributions are going to at least be a help, are going to alleviate some of the stress on the insurance companies, alleviate some of the stress on our, our state and federal government? One of the acts of charity is justice. I think we're talking more about justice. And uh, certainly there is plenty of room for the private sector, for church people as we are, to try to help to provide care. But ultimately we have to go back to our pastoral letter, the United States Bishop's pastoral letter on the economy. We need to look at our whole economy. We have a militaristically based economy. Maybe if we were to uh, take some of that money that has been going to the Contras or that is used to uh, interfere in other places in the world and revise some of the priorities of our economy, we might be able to do justice for our people. I'll tell you what, I'd like to take one more question on this subject. Uh, yes, go ahead, ma'am. Yes, my name is Mina Meyer and I'm with the Los Angeles AIDS Hospice Committee and I was real pleased to hear what was being said by the panel. We're real concerned in all of Los Angeles County, there are no AIDS hospices, no, re no residential place such as there is in San Francisco where they recently opened coming home. Um, we feel that since the cost is at least a third less per day for, uh, than it is to stay for a patient to stay in a hospital, it makes economic sense as well as it makes humane and caring sense. Would you give me a little definition? What is a hospice? I mean, compare, uh, how does a hospice compare to a hospital in terms of the care that is provided, who provides it, how much it costs, who pays? Well, uh, let me start at the top. What a hospice is, is it can be one of two things. There are hospice programs 
that are home health care programs in which a person who knows that they have a disease of which they're dying uh, can get help in their home, they can get a medical team, they can get a volunteer, a social worker, they can get food brought in, whatever is necessary to be able to let them maintain their themselves in their home. If they're, uh, the other kind of program is a residential program, and that's mostly for people who, uh, particularly in the AIDS crisis, no longer are able to maintain their homes. Either perhaps they've lost their jobs and haven't been able to keep their apartments uh, in this particular case, but even if they have some money, maybe they can't quite take care of themselves in their own homes. So they, they need to be in a setting, but it doesn't need to be the expensive acute care setting. So it makes very good sense to offer this this type of treatment for not treatment but this type of housing in essence this type of program for people to stay in um, it's the care has been the stepchild of the AIDS uh, epidemic uh, it's we, we constantly hear about education and yes we need it we constantly hear about testing we don't hear enough about care people don't care and what I'm personally terribly afraid of is that with the terrible overcrowding in hospitals we're going to end up in a situation not too many months or years down the road where they're going to say, well, let's just warehouse them. Let's open some warehouses uh, that, are, that are empty on the, on the wrong side of the tracks and we'll put a bunch of cots in and we'll, we'll send our AIDS patients there. And, 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 I, and finally, I'd like to say, um, uh, we've been talking about AIDS victims tonight and I think that somebody needs to say we're talking about persons with AIDS or use in the vernacular PWAs or PWR. Uh, it's how uh, people with AIDS prefer to be referred to. You are an extraordinarily eloquent person and I thank you very much. It really wasn't thank a question. It was, it was uh, more of a little lecture and a very, well, and a very fine one too. Uh, <laughs> let me, let I, me just I say... Actually have a, I actually have a question and that is what I'm, what I'm concerned about, if you'll allow me, what I am concerned about is the fact that, for instance, with, with insurance, and we were talking about insurance a moment ago, um, my understanding is that for most people, insurance companies are taking, a, taking hospice care on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, most insurance policies are not written with hospice in them, and so if, if the insurance company sees that they can save a lot of money, they sometimes will do that, but it's case-by-case. -case. And then it begins, well, we'll let you have two nursing homes two nursing visits at your home per week but no you can't have three and maybe that patient that person with AIDS needs three so it's a problem and what can we do about that and what can we do in the same way with the more public sector with the entitlement programs which uh, um, which are also insurance programs the public insurance okay. with Medicare Medi you're, you're, st you're still eloquent but you're going on too Thank long you. now okay so let me uh, <laughs> yeah. Bob Gleason, would you, would you try to respond to the hospice question? Um, I think that undoubtedly San Francisco was setting up the best program in the country. And uh, Paul is to be congratulated for that. They've kept the lowest cost, they have some of the best care, and they have some of the best outreach programs. Um, but one of the problems we, we have in San Francisco is the same problem that we've heard to here. That is that we have good care for patients that are in the hospital. We have good care for people who can maintain themselves or whose friends can help maintain themselves let me just, at home. Let me just point out who you are to our radio audience. Okay. It's Dr. Paul Volgading, who is the head of the AIDS clinic uh, at, at San Francisco General. Go Jumping ahead, into this one. The, um, but what we don't have is the, is the kind of care that really is most often needed by an AIDS patient, which is care that falls in between the, the home and the acute hospital. Many insurance policies, including the public ones, reimburse nursing homes at about a $50 rate, $50 a day rate. They reimburse hospitals at about an $800 a day rate, but what we need is a, is a policy that, that comes in the middle at a $250 a day rate for the people who need quite a bit of care but don't need to be in the, in the very expensive hospital. That's a real deficiency. Right. But, but I think the insurers are, and will try to respond to that, this is a new need that's developing and did not really exist five years ago. Nancy Merritt, go ahead quickly if you would, please. Yes, I think one thing, and, and looking at, at corporations, and just to remind people that 85% of the people that do have insurance are in group plans, and those group plans are 25 employees plus. And what's happening in corporations is we're finally waking up to the fact that we are purchasers of a product, and that's health care. And we're demanding a lot more. Uh, Bank of America is self-insured. 
we said to our you know, carrier, we want hospice home care. We want case management. In other words, we're going to have it. And I think that's a role that corporations and companies, no matter what size, need to really demand of the insurance agents as well. Is this is the kind of care we need for our employees. And yes, you know, San Francisco runs, works on the back of a lot of volunteers, and that can't go on forever. All right. I would like to put a period on this particular discussion. AIDS may be a disease without a cure for the present, but there is a good deal that can be done to make the lives of its victims more bearable. Medical reporter Judy Maggio of KVUE in Austin, Texas, looks at the effort underway in her community. Two people from two different worlds. Ashley Borby, a heterosexual woman, and George Childers, a homosexual man who has AIDS. I just believe that we're all in this together. We all want the same things and need the same things, and I think we all have the same fear of being alone. They were paired through the AIDS Services of Austin Buddy Program. Volunteers adopt AIDS patients and serve as a source of support for them. So far, 80 Austinites have dedicated their time and attention as a buddy. It's based on the belief that no one should endure AIDS alone. When it really gets rough, you know, a lot of your friends will fade into the woodwork. And I know that Ashley's going to be there. This Central Texas community has answered the cry for help from its AIDS patients. It's one of only a handful of cities across the nation to pass a law making it illegal to discriminate against people with AIDS. And it's the only place in Texas where city and county tax dollars go directly for services for residents facing this relentless virus. Tax dollars totaling $85,000 in the past two years, matched by private donations. Funds which have helped care for 120 AIDS patients. AIDS Services of Austin. Help starts here. From the first phone call, AIDS Services tries to meet the needs of its clients. Volunteers offer various services like help with daily household tasks. Just sit and you, all right? Okay. A clean house, food, and some days I can't do that. I can't cook for myself or fix a lunch some days, uh, which the AIDS Service pr helps provide. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your Social Security. In another program called The Advocates, volunteers offer AIDS patients legal and financial guidance through the maze of bureaucracy that often comes along with this illness. Through these social service programs, Austin is sharing its skills and humanity with residents debilitated by this deadly disease. But at the rapid rate AIDS is spreading, there is an urgent need for more money and more volunteers. We have a, a lot of people that are helping us, but we always will need more because it is going to touch everybody. Somebody that you know is going to be ill with it. And unfortunately, a lot of times people respond when it's too late. This is Judy Maggio, KVUE Austin for Nightline. Some AIDS facts. How can sexually active people identify safe sex partners? In California, one method is the Partnership Screening Program, which provides this ID card showing the bearer to have tested negative for the AIDS virus. As a backup, a hotline number is available to verify membership. We are, in fact, going to try and change the pace a little bit just for a few minutes, and when we come back, we will talk about sex in the 80s. A national town meeting will continue in a moment. From Los Angeles, a national town meeting on AIDS continues. Here again is Ted Cobble. Not since the sexual revolution has anything had as much impact on American sexual behavior as the AIDS crisis. Paula Gunnis of ABC affiliate KATU in Portland, Oregon reports it's a matter of once again getting to know each other. Getting to know you, getting to know all about you. These days, getting to know one another is more than just a ritual of courtship. It's a matter of life and death. As the threat of AIDS grows, the rules of the dating game are changing. 
Many so-called swinging singles are rewriting their code of sexual behavior. You need to think twice, and uh, protection needs to be the first thing in mind, and uh, sexual pleasure or something needs to be second, you know? If people don't start <laughs> taking care of themselves and being more particular on who they sleep with, it will affect everybody. Singles still go to bars, but many, mostly women, admit they won't go home with the man they meet there. One big change in the dating practices of the 80s is where to meet a date, and possibly a mate. A popular choice, health clubs. It automatically gives you something in common. What you have in common is that you care about taking care of your body, about physical fitness. So it gives you that in common right there. And, you know, maybe with AIDS that, at this point, having that in common is something really great. Not only are the places to meet the opposite sex changing because of the AIDS threat, the language being used to meet those people is changing too. Personal ads in the newspaper used to focus on the words attractive and financially secure. Today, you're more likely to see healthy, disease-free, and monogamous. I'm not dating anyone now, but before I do, I will definitely make him and myself be checked for it because I just think that it's too important. Francis Roth. Judy Stump. One of the biggest changes about sex in the 80s is the AIDS test. Now a California company has taken that safety measure one step further. The American Institute for Safe Sex Practices issues a card to sexually active people who have tested negative to the AIDS virus. It's not a dating service, but one way to identify safe sex partners. There is nothing that's safe other than celibacy. We do not expect the entire world to become celibate. The card idea is the next best thing. For the people currently infected with the AIDS virus, there isn't much hope. But discretion and caution could save the millions of people yet to be exposed. Their fate depends less on science than on their ability to change their behavior in the face of a growing danger called AIDS. I'm Paula Gunnis, KATU in Portland, for Nightline. It is 10.57 here on the West Coast, 1.57 on the East Coast. We're still going strong. Uh, Jeff Levy, you wanted to get in on this issue of those cards. I think nothing could be more irresponsible uh, than issuing cards of that nature. Uh, all the result of a test indicates is that you did not test positive on, at that moment doesn't even mean that you aren't infected as some of the doctors here can explain there's a window period between exposure and development of the antibodies um, the card could be issued this week I could sleep with someone infected tomorrow um, and present this card to another partner the third day and uh, that uh, and I could be, could have been infected by that second encounter um, and therefore would be misleading that third partner um, this is the sort of thing that, that is a substitute, I think, for people making the behavior changes that need to be made to cope, to cope with this epidemic. Right, we, talk, we know how hard it is to change, convince people to stop smoking. Well, it's even harder to get people to change some fundamental sexual behaviors. But that's what we're talking about. That's the sort of thing we've accomplished in the gay community, and that's something that's going to have to be transferred to the heterosexual community as well. ID cards won't be a substitute for Anybody, it. first of all, on the panel who has anything good to say about these ID cards? Anybody at all? Morgan Fairchild. Huh? No, all right. Morgan Fairchild, talk to us about the... the are you single? Yes. Uh, in, in terms of changing of dating, changing of just uh, social behavior among heterosexuals, talk to us uh, uh, about that for a moment. You're someone who has devoted a great deal of time to the cause of AIDS, to what degree is the subject of AIDS impinging on the heterosexual community? Not enough. <laughs> I think it should be a lot more. First of all, I'd like to elaborate on what Jeff said, that the, the window area that they're talking about is generally considered to be about six months. So you could get tested today and be uh, negative and yet have the virus in your system and it would, the antibodies wouldn't be starting measurably uh, being manufactured until at least six months. Well, there's something else I should point out. What these clubs do, and there are some of these clubs where you get the card, mm -hmm. what these clubs effectively do is they say, depending on how much you want to pay, they'll test you twice a year or four times a year. And I guess the point that you're all making, and I don't hear any disagreement here, is that those cards aren't worth the, the, the plastic they're enveloped in. Well, right? what it's got to say is we tested you once and then you were celibate for six months and we'll test you again and now you're safe. Now that I would buy. All right. Cards are very, very dangerous. 
because people they may put down their guard and people could die because of that. People could pass the virus on. They're very dangerous. And I think, it, as Jeff said, it's very, very irresponsible. All right. How is social behavior changing is, is I well, guess, what I'm asking. This, is it changing? You said not I enough. Think it is it changing some. at all? I think it has some. I think certainly in the homosexual community, it's changed a lot. And uh, you see venereal diseases of all kinds way down in the homosexual community. In the heterosexual community, I mean, syphilis has gone through the ceiling, which indicates that people are not being as careful as they should. Um, I talk to different <clears throat> college groups around the country and everything, and, and the one thing that you continually hear, first of all, because kids, because they're young and they feel they're impervious to anything, uh, take the attitude of, oh, well, by the time I get it, uh, they'll have a cure. They don't listen to what the doctors say, that a cure is a long way away. Uh, they say, oh, well, I'm just sleeping around with my friends, and they're clean. Uh, but not taking into consideration uh, other things that could be affecting it besides homosexuality or IV drug use. For instance, a friend of mine uh, has a son who's only 26 and uh, his best friend has AIDS. He contracted it from his wife. They were high school sweethearts and got married. She had a blood transfusion four years ago. She's already died and uh, the boy has AIDS. And these are two kids who, who weren't doing anything offbeat or, or in any way illicit and yet they're paying the price for it and this is something that kids have to be aware now is that it's not just always uh, the high risk element that they've got to be aware of people have got to take responsibility for themselves and stop with this attitude of like it's not me we got a phone call from out here in california go ahead call it please hello yes um my boyfriend who may have been exposed to aids refuses to wear a condom and i wonder if there's anything that i can do to protect myself from AIDS, such as using a vaginal cream containing a chemical called, called non-oxal-9, which I've I'd, heard kills the AIDS virus. Yeah, I don't, oh boy, I, I think the safest thing you can do is drop your boyfriend, uh, you know, and, and fast. <laughs> That's Tim, exactly Tim. what I was going to say, drop your boyfriend, get rid of him. Uh. No, I, I'm saying it seems to me that if there's something that women could do that they had total control over. Yeah, drop your boyfriend. No, but I, I'll tell you what. This might have a huge effect on stopping I'm, the spread of AIDS. I'm sorry to have given you a flippant reply because you really deserve better. Dr. Uh, Volbeding, is there, is there in fact such a vaginal spray or a vaginal cream that, that protects against AIDS? No, not, nothing that's, that you should count on. The, the condom is really quite effective if it's used properly, if it doesn't break. Mm. Even that has a certain failure rate. There are vaginal uh, spermicidal jellies that that are active in the laboratory but they've never been tested in people we don't know that they're safe uh, we don't know that they'll change the risk and I think um, it, it, if I were a woman if I knew my my boyfriend had perhaps been exposed to this virus that I would certainly want to want him tested to, to know whether he was infected and I would not have unprotected sex all right Vicki Mays would you uh this is the very reason that education is so important. I think that what women have to do is to really begin to get more information. For instance, to learn how to negotiate safer sex contracts, to know the different kinds of condoms, to talk to their boyfriends about using the condoms, to be able to have a discussion about sex. That's not something that we do very easily in this society. Let me just ask, is the caller still on the line from California? No, all right, I'm sorry, we lost that call. Uh, sexual contracts, what does that mean, Carol Lee? Uh, well, I certainly know about sexual contracts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, usually I see men who are referred to me, or, or men I know, and I'll always mention that I use safe practices for everything and condoms for everything, and usually before a date, of course, one should say that they use condoms for everything. One thing I was wondering about non-oxidol 9, I would imagine that it wouldn't really be safe to uh, have sex with someone who's seropositive without non-oxanol-9, have intercourse, I would feel that non-oxanol-9 should be incorporated. Additionally, though. I, I would, and another thing I, I, you, you might want to comment on, um, I know that there are many women out there who have bisexual husbands or lovers who are IV users who just aren't using condoms now. I wonder if they should start at least as a first step using the non-oxanol-9, and I, I would like you to comment on that. I, I don't see any problem with it. The, the issue is whether it instills a, a 
perhaps false sense of security and and really we should be putting our our effort it's, it seems to me in, into those areas that we think are the best protective uh, devices and that's certainly the condom first all right i'd like uh, to go i think the combination uh, is what we would usually recommend excuse me for interrupting i'd like to go to another caller and, and again it's from california go ahead caller <laughs> yes hi my name is gary adler i have a question about the ingestion of vaginal secretions is it a contradiction to engage in cunnilingus and then to use a condom during intercourse all right now which doctor wants to pick up oh, tim johnson <laughs> Uh, Paul and I are saying to each other. Uh, but, uh, I guess the question is, first of all, can you contract AIDS from cunnilingus? I'm not impressed that we know enough to answer that question very intelligently. Certainly there is the theoretical possibility, but uh, I just don't think we have enough good evidence to say that that's a high-risk situation. And I'd like to hear what Paul says in response also. There have been a number of studies that try to look at the issue of oral sex as a, as a risk factor for AIDS. None of them, to my knowledge, have shown any proof that oral sex, usually uh, the studies involve male homosexuals, I, w I would think that the risk would be, if anything, less with, with uh, male-female or oral sex. Um, so I, I, I don't think there's a significant risk, but it's very hard to prove because most people don't just engage in one kind of sexual behavior. They engage in a whole spectrum from, and that's been the same story with kissing, that, that you right. can't separate them so out very easily. So specifically, to answer the question that, that the caller asks, it does make sense then to use a condom even though you may be engaging in oral sex. A condom for oral sex no, 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 for no, 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 not, doesn't help. No, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I guess I didn't make myself clear. And, uh, <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that if you're going to engage in oral sex and then thereafter have regular sex, it still makes sense to definitely, use a condom. Definitely. Right? Definitely. Okay. Kind of, we, yes, a, I think it's urgent to, to recommend a condom for oral sex, especially on the first date with a partner I, that one doesn't I know. I meant kind of linguist, not that. Oh, you... <laughs> I must say, for first dates have changed a lot. <laughs> uh, okay, we have a caller from Massachusetts. Massachusetts, go ahead. Um, yes, my children will be entering kindergarten soon. There's so many children with cold sores, cancers, chicken pox, um, secretion of fluids from all of these. Um, and with children sharing their food, drinks, how should I caution them, uh, you know, about the AIDS factor? And I also, you know, I don't want to get them hysterical over it. I, I just don't know how to go about cautioning them. All right, let's, let's go to Dr. Fauci, who is with the National Institutes of Health and probably knows as much about this subject as anyone alive. What, what, what do you tell a mother or father who's worrying about what to tell their kids? And I, I should tell our audience, we're going to be getting into the subject of education and children a little bit later in this broadcast. What should you tell your children with regard to, I mean, for example, is it possible to get AIDS through, through food? Let's say, uh, let's say that a restaurant worker uh, cuts his finger bleeds into the food is it possible to get aids from that well i think the first thing that the uh, a parent who's informed should tell the child is that aids virus is transmitted by sex by blood or blood products and by mother to child the theoretical question of someone cutting their hand in food and then having someone ingest that getting the aids virus there's no evidence whatever that that occurs that the transmissibility occurs that way Again, when you're talking about situations where someone might have a cut in their mouth, there's always the very far out possibility that it does occur. But if you look at the scientific data of transmissibility, there's no evidence at all that it's transmitted that way. Yes, Congressman, go ahead. You want With to all due respect to Dr. Fauci, uh, the fact of the matter is that three or four percent of the 35 cases reported by CDC of AIDS in America, CDC can't tell us how they got it. Yeah, I'm yeah, not suggesting I, that it necessarily you proves... Mean th you mean 35,000 yeah. cases? There yeah, are 3 to 4% of 35,000. About 1,000 yeah. cases, CDC cannot tell us how they got it. I'm yeah, not suggesting I, that proves social transmissibility. We have to go back in. But I don't believe we should exclude it. I think when we say to the American people, 
the causes of it, we should say there are some things, some things about this disease in terms of how people get it, we don't know. All right, Dr. Fauci, this might be as good a time as any. Now, I want you to respond to that. Yeah. Pick, pick, pick up a lot of little, uh, maybe they're old wives' tales, maybe they're not, mosquitoes. You, I mean, you've heard all these things. Where do those 3 to 4% then come from? How do you account for those? Well, first of all, it's important to emphasize that many of those 3 or 4% that are undetermined uh, transmissibility are in individuals in which the CDC has not had the opportunity to appropriately interview the individuals. Many of them have died or have not been available uh, for interview. So I don't think the figure is nearly as high as that 3 or 4%. The, the, the point about using that 3 or 4% to divert attention away from the modalities of transmissibility that we're sure of, the three that I mentioned, I think is, is a diversion and it creates unnecessary panic that there's looming out there a certain percentage of cases of unknown transmissibility which detracts and takes away from the real education of understanding how it is transmitted. We have an extraordinary amount of data knowing how it's transmitted, and we have very good data knowing about how it's not transmitted. Just so take, me, take me back, though, Dr. Fauci, to the original question by the woman who, who called in from Massachusetts. Anything that she should tell her youngsters when they go off to school? I mean, presumably these kids are young enough that they're not going to be engaging in sex and they're not going to be uh, engaging in IV drug use. Therefore, do they even need to be aware of the AIDS problem? Well, I think that a child who is going to be having normal interactions with their, their classmates in school should realize that the AIDS virus is not transmitted that way. So the best thing that a mother or father can do for that child is to take away the anxiety of thinking that if that child sits next to someone in the class who might be infected with the AIDS virus, that that child might get the AIDS virus from that person. That's the best thing the mother and father can do for that child. All right, we are going to go to the subject of, of AIDS and education and what to tell our youngsters uh, when we return, but we're going to take a break now and we'll be back in a moment. This special edition of Nightline, a national town meeting on AIDS, continues. Here again is Ted Koppel. And you are seeing once again, those of you who are watching on television, the names of our expert panelists and uh, the cameras panning over some of the faces of our panelists here in Los Angeles. Uh, I should tell you that uh, a couple of our panelists have had to leave us. Uh, Mayor Feinstein in Osaka, Japan has had to leave us, and Gary Bauer uh, in Washington has had to leave us, but the rest are hanging in beautifully here as we come to the end of our third hour on this national town meeting on, on AIDS. Uh, and I can promise you we still have some rather extraordinary things to show you. One of the major national debates set off by the AIDS crisis is over the issue of education. What should children be told and when? Jay Shadler of our affiliate WCVB in Boston reports on the impact of that issue on one big city school system. In a more innocent time, issues of teen sexuality seemed elementary. Do you think that it's uh, a good thing for two high school students to go steady? Well, I think that for a girl, I know it gives you a lot of security, and you feel that you don't have to worry about a date. But the old rules don't fit in today's game. It's a little bit like people have been wittingly or unwittingly involved in a poker game with sex education. And the stakes were penny ante. Now with AIDS, the stakes are everything we have. What is AIDS? Um, I, it's a form of, you know, it's VD, but has a plague almost. Can girls get AIDS? I don't know. With AIDS, ignorance and misinformation can be lethal. For without a cure or a vaccine, education is the only weapon against the disease. Schools are waking up to the fact that uh, we're teaching about everything else except something we should be teaching about. Yet in order to teach students about AIDS, you have to talk to them frankly about sex. And because the disease can be transmitted by the most intimate sexual contact, simple biology courses about fallopian tubes and male hormones won't make the grade anymore. 
So consider this pilot program on AIDS that the Massachusetts Department of Health would eventually like to see in every school district in the state. It begins with a short true-false quiz on the disease, aimed at exposing the myths that masquerade as facts. Having sexual intercourse is not risky for becoming infected with the AIDS virus as long as you are not gay and you know your partners pretty well. And this is false. Uh, first of all, AIDS is not a gay disease. It doesn't care who you are, what color you are, uh, what religion you are, if you're old, young, gay, or straight. It's quickly apparent that this is not a course that schools still struggling to decide if sex education belongs in their curriculum will find very comforting. The questions are frank, the answers honest. The AIDS virus really likes blood and semen, living cells, to, to stay alive, okay? When someone sleeps with someone else, has intercourse, you have to look at it this way, that you're sleeping with everyone that other person slept with and who those people slept with. If you, like, made out with someone, you wouldn't get it if they had it? I can't say that with, uh, I can't say that with all certainty. I can say that there's never been a case that they can say that that activity was the reason. As the course develops, its focus changes, deepens. Now the teens are drawn into a discussion that strikes closer to home. What if a friend or relative had AIDS? Suddenly, small doors of fear, windows of prejudice open. That nobody really, truly knows the whole effect of the disease. That's like saying if she had AIDS, would you want to sit by her? No, you probably she, wouldn't, right? You know. Well, if we just found out she had AIDS, would you, sit, would you still sit now? No. You wouldn't? No. AIDS is AIDS, no matter who has it. If a uh, cousin or your neighbor has it, it's still AIDS. Uh -huh. I don't agree with that. In the end, the students leave this class without receiving either a grade or a final test score, even though they may have just learned one of the most important lessons of their young lives. Jay Shadler, WCVB Boston, for Nightline. I want to tell those of you who have been trying to call in, and some of you are very frustrated when you call in and feel that the phones are skewed toward the West Coast and you're having great trouble getting through. I promise you they're not skewed toward the West Coast, even though we have had a number of phone calls from California. Uh, I'm assured that the phone company is trying to get them through from all over the country, but as you can understand, there are hundreds of thousands of phone calls coming in and very few that we can take. Let me just give you the numbers again. Uh, in California, the number is 1-800-227-8234. I'm only going to give that once so that we can skew toward the rest of the country now, where the number is 1-800-624-7564. For the whole country other than California, 1-800-624-7564. Let's talk for a moment, Morgan Fairchild, about role models. I mean, it's all well and good to talk about educating kids and making sure that they understand about condoms and safe sex practices. And yet all we see on television and what we see in the movies is a heightened sense of sexuality. Are we going to have to reach a point in our culture in which we start saying implicitly to the kids who are watching we really are changing we we are not quite as promiscuous as we once were is is there a place for that i think it's already happening i think that and not on uh, the television i'm watching well i th from what i've heard when i've been checking around town the last few days uh, knowing that i was coming on here i've called a lot of different people uh, what I'm hearing is that people are trying to gear more toward romance, uh, that people are, uh, the kids actually, are, are getting a little more turned off of very explicit sex, uh, that explicit sex, gratuitous sex, is not as popular as it was. Uh, I think that Hollywood is trying to gear toward a more romance again and less bed hopping, and I think that... It, the more that the population itself is educated, the more they will see promiscuity and blatant bed hopping as stupid and bad as opposed to fun as it was once looked upon. And I'd also like to say something in reference uh, to what we were talking about a minute ago. It, it ties in with education, but it also has to do with a woman's right in this uh, with the caller whose uh, boyfriend refused to wear a condom. And my feeling is that women in these situations have got to take their lives into their own hands and that if you can't have a reasonable discussion with somebody that you love that you want to sleep with and they don't care enough about you to take care of themselves and to take precautions then 
why should a woman have to be stupid enough to go along with that? Can Let me jump in here. All right, Harvey Firestein, you want to get in on this? Go ahead. I just, I would like to make a point that promiscuity is not what gives people AIDS. It's the actual acts, the sexual acts that they perform. You could have sex with one person, unhealthful sex, and get AIDS. Or you could have sex with a couple of thousand people and have healthful, safer sex and not get AIDS. Harvey, forgive me. That sounds like a lot of baloney. I mean, the, you know, the chances, the chances of, the chances of, of the contracting chances of, AIDS when you are randomly hopping around from person to person and know little excuse, about your sexual partners. I understand if you found a thousand people and you check their pedigree carefully. No, 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 no. If you have masturbatory sex, no, uh, um, you know the words, um, <laughs> mouth to things, things to things. Masturbation. It's, 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 it's late, in, it's late enough in the night and we've got an adult enough audience. Use any words you like, Harvey. Go All ahead. Right. If you're having genital to genital sex with one person and that person has AIDS, you can contract AIDS. If you are having mass mutual masturbation with a thousand different people, there's no exchange of fluids and you can't get AIDS. Do you understand? It's the act. It's the actual sexual act. There's no such thing as a high-risk group. There are high-risk activities. All right. Okay. Education. Try and understand. Carol, Carol Lee, go ahead, and then I want to get to Father Wood, because I... Uh, go ahead, Carol. Actually, that was pretty much what I was going to say, but... Fine. Um, one, one more just tiny thing. You know, it, I, it's dangerous to stigmatize people who are having multiple sexual partners, and, you know, we're trying to guard people's rights. Uh, certainly we don't want laws uh, all over the country passed against sodomy and people should be able to have multiple partners. I think, you know, we shouldn't necessarily equate romantic sex w with good sex. Sex can serve kind of relaxing functions and, and spiritual. People have sex in very different ways and, and their rights need to be preserved. All right. Father Ward, let's get back to the kids and the education of youngsters. We got a real problem here. You've got a real problem here because on the one hand, you don't want as a as a priest in good standing, you don't want these kids to be induced in any way to engage in sex, but by the same token as someone who is concerned about the problem of age, you must know that education is terribly important. Now, how how do you, how does a good Catholic, how does anyone in the in the country resolve that that problem, that paradox, that dilemma? Well, I could start out by using a dirty word and you say it's okay this late at night, but that's chastity. Chastity is a misused, misunderstood word, I think. Basically, in trying to teach children, we want to teach them how they live most humanly, and chastity is a word for living sexually responsible lives. Uh, with regard to education, I think the context and how you do the education is a very important question here, too. I think we presume sometimes that we're just talking about what goes on in school. But uh, we might uh, ask the question, how do you teach a child how to love? How do you teach a child that he or she is loved and is lovable? How do you teach a child to live a just life and a good life? How do you teach people to live in community? Father, I don't, forgive me for interrupting, yes. I don't disagree with a single thing that you've said, mm -hmm. but you're dealing with fallible human beings. You're yes. dealing with people who are going to engage in sex. You're dealing with people who do mess around. You're dealing with people who do commit adultery. You're dealing with well, a world... I thought we were talking about children now, Ted, who haven't learned how to do that yet. Yeah, I know. Our but society you, hasn't oh, taught them that. Are you going to wait? Teenage pregnancy yeah. rate, and you'll see that kids do <laughs> engage in sex. And they do. So and why I think we have to really think deeply about the what's going on in our culture. Why do they? Why does a, a young woman especially a, a young woman who's living in poverty, get pregnant. I think often enough, most of the time, it is because this young woman feels that she's not worthwhile, that she needs to bring a new life into, in, a new child into life who will love her, or she oh, needs to, there oh, are all sorts of factors. That you know, all that is yeah, Jeff, Francis, all right, Jeff Levy, go ahead. Have to be, I think you still have to be realistic in the time that it will take to change the values of this society and to do that kind of teaching that you're talking about, there's still kids having sex. And we can't consign them 
to to engaging in risky behavior. And we just have so to we teach them okay. the things they Excuse need me. to but don't know, we have to go including teaching than them that. about yeah. condoms. Yeah. Just Grant, so granted we, that that's true, don't we have to go further, though? Just so we don't confuse one another. Okay. Vicki Mays, tell us how young some of these young mothers are. I think it depends upon what part of the United States, but we often see um, as young as 10 years old, 10 to 14 years old, we're seeing that um, people are having children at that early age. Now, what about the, I mean, you know, what Father Wood says is certainly true, morality, chastity, teaching the children the right values. Is that going to work? There's a long-term solution. There's a short-term solution, and AIDS, it happens very quickly. I think that while what what he's saying is very true that we have to teach those values at the same time we have to give people information about sexual behavior we have to give people adequate information to make choices i would agree with that and i think however it's words. the context of the information uh that's important uh that it should not just be a matter of giving facts in the classroom i think that if we are seriously going to deal with the education of children we have to bring parents back into the educational process. They have a responsibility there. But most of I the think we need to bring the, the community into it. When yeah. you say bring the parents back in, when you yeah. say bring the community back in, you've been listening to this program tonight. We are absolutely surrounded by people, and I include myself in the group, who are ignorant on different aspects of the story, who are ignorant on different aspects of the dangers involved. Yes, so you need people who really know what they're talking about. Well, don't parents you? have to be brought into the educational process as learners as well as teachers. All right, let's go, the uh, lady up there is, is uh, I think her question and her own function is directly related to the subject. Go ahead, ma'am. I'm Medaris and I'm a sex education teacher. I also write books for kids, teenagers about sexuality. And my question is really directed toward government officials. We have ten, an estimated 10 million kids in this country who use hard drugs some of them taken intravenously. We have 57% of the teenagers in this country sexually active, many with multiple partners. There's no question that these kids need a sex education program or an AIDS education program that includes information, nitty gritty information about how to get a condom, how to buy it, how to use it. I think that the curriculum has to include chastity is an option but those programs just say no to sex often preach to the converted they don't address the needs of kids who are sexually active and who therefore at the greatest risk for aids I'll tell you my what. question to the to the national government people is when our kids come back to school this fall is the national government going to be there so that kids in our schools are going to teenagers are going to have a sex education program next fall right now when we need it look the only national government official we had was gary bauer and i told you he left but let me tell you our schools yeah, and, and of well, course yeah, congressman back there. Oh, oh, well i know <laughs> uh, but but uh, you know some some people will say with gratitude and some of the regret he is not a national official uh go ahead congressman i think that if we want to find out what public expenditures for education in the sexual area is going to do to our society, we can have a little indication from what we have experienced for the money we've spent for family planning in the last 20 years. Family planning began in this country about 1970 for the ostensible purpose of reducing pregnancies of all people in our population base. We have roughly quadrupled expenditures for family planning in the last 20 years in this country a little over 300 million dollars last year at the federal level and for that money education for people about how to prevent pregnancies we now have in the age group of 15 and 19 we have increased the abortion rate by 50 percent and we have doubled the pregnancy rate what? now what it says to us is when we teach our kids in this instance about how to prevent pregnancies, we have developed more sexual activity. Whether but we that, like that, that or not... that ignores some facts, that's, sir. That's what One the facts show. One of the facts show. it ignores is that it, it, it confuses family planning funding with sex education in the schools. Less than 10% or 35%, depending on whose study you use, of the schools in this nation have a comprehensive sex education class. We do not have teach birth control in our nation's high school. That is a fallacy. Yes, we fund family planning funding is funding clinics and hospitals to pass out birth control. It's not teaching teenagers about sex. It also one of the, ignores one of the, the fact that I'd our like... society has changed a lot in the last 20 years, and that has more to do with the increase in teenage and sexuality I agree than with funding the... birth control clinics. 
I agree with the father that we should be involving we should be involving the parents in this field of sexual education but would you believe that in the case of family planning there is no requirement that the place where the teenager asks for advice notify or contact the parents at all. I not only believe it, I agree with it. My and I question... believe that if we, want, <laughs> if we want parents to be involved with sexual education of their children, we can't separate those activities. No, I'm not suggesting when our that kids we do come separate those activities. My question is, are we going to fund sex it. education for kids in the schools, and are we going to fund a community-based program to get parents to start teaching with their kids about it? Well, I think you've heard what Congressman Dannemeyer would have to say on that subject. Let me, we, we have a caller from Florida who I think actually has a question for you, so stay, stay at the mic if you would. Go, go ahead, caller. Yes, I uh, just wanted to know what could we possibly expect any time in the near future for education, what we might be able to see in the schools, and what somebody may do to help that cause along. In other words, you're saying what kind of education ought to be in the schools? Is that no, what you're what asking? What we expect might be done in the, in the future. State of what California. are they going to do? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. In the state of California, there's currently a bill before the legislature that, uh, that would, that's already passed out of the Senate, and I hope will pass the House, which would make mandatory from 7th to 12th grade for all students in, in California to just at least see an AIDS film. That's not adequate to my mind. I think a minimum has to include much more than that. You have to prepare kids for the film. You have to desensitize them to the classroom use of sexual words. You have to give them some background information on, on what intercourse is and the varieties of it. You have to include information about homo and heterosexuality, about sexual decision making. But there is a basic core curriculum that could be covered within a semester and it could start this next fall. And if everybody who thought that way called up their legislators and said, where is it, and vote for this bill in California and, and spoke in their own state, then we could have that happen by next fall. All right, Dr. Stephen Joseph, the uh, health commissioner of New York City, would like to get in on the, on the discussion. Go ahead, Dr. Right. Joseph. I'd like to get in on this uh, to say, you know, your, your doctor doesn't always tell you what you want to hear, but he darn well better tell you what you need to know. We have to educate our children, and this has to start well earlier than the high school. In New York City, the leading cause of death of women between the ages of 25 and 29 is now AIDS. Those women were infected three to five years ago. We have hardly begun to scratch the surface in this country to protect the children and young women now who will be the AIDS cases in 1991. We have to talk about values. We have to talk about the values of abstinence, but we have got to protect those children who are already sexually active We've got to protect those children who are looking down the gun barrel of IV drug use. And unless we do that, we are going to have even more cases of AIDS in this country than we think we're going to have. Sometimes when we talk too much in terms of statistics and generalities, our eyes start to glaze over. Occasionally, I think we have to bring it down again to one person. We're going to tell you a story now about one person, a New York woman, who died of AIDS. Last summer, Nightline broadcast the tragic story of a woman dying of AIDS who was being reunited with her children for the last time. The story of Priscilla Diaz prompted a $3 million donation to the hospital where she was treated from the Joan Crock Foundation. Correspondent Jed Duval looks back on Priscilla Diaz and brings us up to date on her children. This was Priscilla Diaz in the good days, a strong, attractive young mother. And Priscilla Diaz last July, a victim of AIDS, wasting away barely 65 pounds. Unable to care for her four children, she had sent them off to live with relatives. But weakening with each succeeding illness and sensing death was imminent, she asked to be reunited with her children one last time. I feel happy because those are my kids and I love them and I would like to have them with me. Knowing her children were coming, knowing that this was something which could give her some kind of closure on her life to say goodbye to people, goodbye to her children, to see them being well taken care of has been something that's kept her going. How did a deeply religious 37-year-old mother get AIDS? From her husband. A good man, the family says, but one who used drugs. When he used to use his drugs, he just used to do it himself and that's it, but... When it came to bringing, you know, groceries to the house, that's the first thing he does. 
Priscilla's husband had died of AIDS a few months earlier. Eventually, uh, something is going to happen to her. We expect it sooner or later. But we're doing all we can. That's why we, we, we took the kids on time. Because we knew that if those kids would stay here with her, the government, I mean the city, would have taken them. When I took the kids, I didn't expect to see, like, to see, those, to see those kids again. Because the way she looked when I left. So thanks to God, and she was able to see her kids, which I think was her dream, you know, to see those kids again. Hi. Hi. Hey, Sarah, we like to stay with them and not let them go. You know, stay with them. And instead of letting go, stay with me, you know? Every single one of these cases is an enormous personal tragedy. Priscilla's is really different only in that her course has been punctuated by a few days of tremendous joy. And that she was able to see her children and able to come to peace with her whole life. The reunion had a cost. Diaz was weak and drawn, her temperature 104 degrees. She had developed pneumonia. How are you doing today? Oh, it's good to see you. When I talked to her, she said, yes, I want to come in the hospital. And we talked uh, about how she wanted to die, and she told me quite definitively she wanted to die in the hospital. Now she's just lost everything. She's weak. But she has too much faith in her. That's what's keeping her alive, the faith that she has. The only thing that she don't got is us with her. That's the only thing she don't got. Mommy, I love you. I love you. The persons, the victims of this disease are not strange, unusual zombies off in the corner somewhere. They're people very much like all of us with lives, hopes, families and dreams that are just being shattered by this disease. A few weeks later, Priscilla Diaz died alone in the AIDS ward at the Bronx Municipal Hospital Center. The children were scattered. Jasmine, now eight years old, lives in Miami with her Aunt Minerva. The twin boys, Saul and Christian, now six years old, are living with Minerva's parents in Puerto Rico. Milton, now 16, is also in Puerto Rico. He lives with Priscilla's aging mother. He rarely sees the twins, who are a three-hour drive away, or his sister, who's a plane ride away. His ambition is to go to college, but he probably will not be able to afford it. That's one of the harsh realities of AIDS. So many of its victims, such as Priscilla and her husband, are struck down in the primes of their lives when their children need them the most. This is Jed Duval for Nightline. West Germany with 675, 12 in the Soviet Union, 21 in Japan, and Brazil with 1,110 confirmed or suspected cases of AIDS. Like the victims of other incurable diseases, there are some people suffering from AIDS who feel they'd rather end their lives under circumstances of their own choosing rather than endure the final ravages of the illness. The Netherlands is one country where euthanasia is permitted. Correspondent Hilary Bauker reports on how it is becoming a center for dying AIDS victims. Max. Ronald. 
Stanley. In Amsterdam this weekend, the living remembered the dead. Most died of AIDS, but some took their lives before AIDS took them. One was a friend of Jeanette Cox. He was suffering from Carposi sarcoma, a fatal form of cancer common to AIDS victims. He told me, yeah, I don't want to live anymore. My Carposi is all over my body. All my skin is Carposi and I don't want to live anymore. And I want you to be with me when I die. And she was with him. Jeanette's friend died with his family and friends around him. Chose the time and the place of his death. He died by euthanasia, by mercy killing. It's an accepted practice here in Holland for terminally ill patients who request it. And more and more of those patients are suffering from AIDS. Peter Janssen discovered his illness only a few months ago, but the disease has spread quickly. I think uh, people should, uh, should uh, decide uh, themselves uh, about, uh, about uh, their life and, and how, to, uh, how to end it. Last week, Peter signed a document authorizing his doctor to perform euthanasia. When Peter decides, he's ready to die. Peter's doctor, Jakob Ten Veen, says AIDS patients suffer terribly at the end. It will be tens and hundreds, eventually, per year that will die, still. And I think quite a lot of them will ask for euthanasia in the end. Why? Well, why not? Actually, I mean, I would ask it myself if I were in such a situation. But to take your own life, that is something. Euthanasia is something these AIDS outpatients have thought about. Case Rieskoop says for him, it's a question of religious belief. And in that belief, I'm not allowed to take my own life. Then I, the time is coming that I have to suffer. Then I must try to accept it as my... Anton Riesma still isn't sure. Well, when I think uh, rationally, you know, just like, are you okay, you got AIDS, you got all kinds of infections, your immune system is completely ruined and you're going to die in a few, in some time. Why not end it now and just get it over with? Doctors in Holland must follow strict guidelines to make sure the patient really wants euthanasia, that he's hopelessly ill, and that a second doctor concurs. Only then is the final pill or injection administered. Essentially, it's uh, the same method as is used to uh, induce anesthesia, but only by using larger doses of drugs. So what happens is that uh, the patient uh, goes to sleep and never wakes up, really. There is no instant euthanasia on demand in Holland. And the Voluntary Euthanasia Society has to tell the AIDS patients who call and write from America and the rest of the world not to come. I'm very sorry because I know that they will suffer much more than, in my view, is really necessary. If you have to die so young from such a, a nasty disease, I, I would like everyone to die in peace. And that's not possible then, and that's... Horrible. I know, I know my life could end very soon. Stephen Althoff is an American living in Amsterdam. He has the option of euthanasia, but does That's not it. want it. I will try and preserve my own life as long as I can. In a room down the hall, uh, Peter Janssen has made a different decision. Uh, and I don't want to uh, um, to live like, uh, or not live like uh, a, a human uh, human person. If Peter decides his life has become intolerable, he knows his doctor will help him end it, will help him sleep, never to wake. Hilary Balker for Nightline in Amsterdam. Now.
Leonard Matlovich, you told us a couple of hours ago you think you have about a year left to live. Would that be, is that even a, a conceivable option to you? No, it's not. And neither is euthanasia, and I intend to be well, around for a long time. That's what I mean. The, when I said I had a year left to live, that would be what they say now. But I don't intend to give up. I intend to keep fighting. And I have never seen so much courage, so much love in this community in the gay and lesbian community it, it has made me a very very proud person it has given me a lot of courage it's given me the strength to continue and i will fight this and i will fight it and i will fight it and society will be better off because of all of our suffering i want to use the opportunity of of the piece that hillary bowker did over there in holland to focus on something we really haven't touched on at all tonight, and I'd like to go to New York where my colleague, uh, ABC's medical correspondent, George Street, is sitting. George, uh, a few weeks ago, you came back from having spent a couple of weeks in Africa, where, in fact, the AIDS problem is greater than in any other area of the world, is it not? Would you, it's would almost you talk, unimaginable. Talk to us. Uh, I was in Zaire, and what I found in Zaire it was a government, a people, a group of doctors dealing with a situation of unbelievable proportions. In the capital city of Kinshasa, maybe as many as one out of five people are infected with the AIDS virus. And uh, for a lot of cultural reasons, they don't know it. Uh, doctors don't, uh, don't, don't tell them. But as bad as the situation is, and as much as people struggle uh, to fight it, there's still Africa, uh, Kinshasa, and in Zaire, and in other countries in Africa, they're still dealing with the denial problem. A lot of people don't want to admit that there is a situation uh, there that is, that is as bad uh, as it is. But more than that, the situation in Africa, uh, a lot of people in the United States look at it, and they ask the question, is it a mirror for what is going to happen here? Well, in one sense it is, and in one sense it isn't. Uh, the, the kind of spread that uh, happens in Africa, it's, it's almost all heterosexual because there's very little IV drug abuse and very little homosexuality there. So uh, the virus is spread heterosexually. Uh, that could happen here, but nowhere is near to the same extent. But in one way, Africa is a mirror for the United States, and it's this. The AIDS virus is spread in only three ways. In utero, mother to child, in uh, blood products, and in multiple sex partners. Those are the risk factors in Africa. They are the risk factors here. Dr. Jonathan Mann, uh, you are with the World Health Organization. Explain to us, uh, because I know this is going to be one of the fears that uh, the viewers and listeners will have, explain to us the degree to which AIDS travels. Well, there's nothing too mysterious in the sense that people who are infected with the virus transmit the virus to other people. And it's clear that this disease is already a worldwide phenomenon. The numbers quoted earlier in your report are about six months old. There are now over 51,000 cases of AIDS reported from, it is true, 113 countries around the world. We estimate there are five to 10 million infected people throughout the world. This disease affects Central and South America, the Caribbean, Europe, Africa, and now parts of Asia and Oceania as well. So it's a global problem, and I think this is one aspect of this entire picture that the American public uh, seems to, in general, not be very aware of, and it is a critical part because it will not be possible to stop AIDS in one country until it is stopped in all countries. We are in this together as a globe, and it's, a, it's really a, an international health problem. Explain to me, why is it, to what degree, for example, uh, is the spread of AIDS on a continent like Africa a function of a lack of communication, a lack of radio, a lack of television, a lack of willingness on the part of government, uh, uh, an inaccessibility to health authorities, because it would seem to me that if you go on the basis of access to information, the United States ought to have the fewest number of, of AIDS and AIDS-related cases, and, and Africa perhaps the most. Well, I'd, I'd like to get back to the point that Mr. Strait made earlier uh, to disagree. That is to say that the World Health Organization is now working with 30 African governments setting up AIDS prevention and control programs at the national level. The remaining African governments have, are all eager to start as rapidly as possible. AIDS information and education programs in Africa, in some cases, are showing signs of effectiveness already. For example, among prostitutes in Kenya, 
with a careful intervention person to person education program over 90 percent of the prostitutes are using condoms and among the others the clients themselves are demanding that condoms be used educational programs are underway in many parts of africa and i think those positive steps actually have for us in the in the industrialized world some lessons what Not to get what, into a debate with uh, jonathan mann but uh, one of the one of the problems in africa of course is a lack of money and I was talking to a uh, person from, the, uh, from AID who was in Zambia, and he said that uh, he was showing up with, uh, with uh, 3.5 million condoms. Well, since there are 3.5 million sexually active adults in Zambia, he had uh, potentially only a one-day supply. So while the education programs are, are, are proceeding and the World Health Organization is doing uh, a remarkable job, there's a lot, uh, lot more that can be done and needs to be done especially uh, in education because condoms uh, i can remember talking to the medical director at the uh, mama Yemo hospital in in kinshasa he's a man of about 40 to 45 years old and he said how can i tell my patients about condoms how can i tell them uh, how to use condoms when i've never seen one there is also and and neither one of you has touched on it yet there is a there is a cultural problem uh and it is not a cultural problem unique to africa it's uh, you know the same thing exists in china uh, namely, the desire, particularly of agrarian people, to want children because you need people to work the land. Now, how are they going to overcome that problem in countries like Africa, or, or in, in, uh, on continents like Africa, and in some parts of Asia, and I presume also in Latin America? Well, I, I first uh, definitely agree with George that there is a tremendous resource need. I mean, the World Health Organization has estimated that it will cost billions of dollars to effectively deal with and try to control AIDS in the, in, in the developing parts of the world over the next few years. The cultural problems can be addressed. I mean, let's remember, after all, that every culture in the world is strong. It's strong because it survived. And when faced with a problem of the dimensions of AIDS for countries, for example, like Uganda, the culture will respond, is showing signs already of responding, and this is indeed a challenge as deep to the African cultures as it is to the American culture and American society. Fundamental values are being brought into question, but cultures are strong enough, they'll survive, they'll figure out ways to deal with AIDS and to educate the people. All right, let's bring you it know, back. You know, uh, George, if you'll forgive me, uh, uh, Leonard Matlovich wants to get in on this and Tim Johnson wants to get in. Leonard? Well, you know, we were talking about, or he was talking about uh, it'll cost billions of dollars to educate the people in Africa. Well, think of the cost of not educating them, the medical cost of providing medical care to those people, which will be more staggering ever than the cost of education. And we are in a world crisis. This is not one country, it's the world. And I really think this is where we need an international Marshall Plan, a, a Manhattan Project. We really need the President or, or the United Nations. Someone needs to call people together, leadership of the world, and say, we've got to solve this problem. We've got to put our resources behind it and find a cure. Let me interrupt. Excuse me, I, I, must, I must interrupt there, Mr. Koppel, because I, there's, a, there's a basic question here, which is that the World Health Organization, the organization that eradicated smallpox, has the responsibility and role to do exactly what you've just suggested. And indeed, there is a global strategy. The, every nation in the world has been marshaled behind the global strategy, and we believe that at the Venice Summit, to come in just a few days, you'll see yet another affirmation of the global effort to control AIDS with the World Health Organization fulfilling its constitutional and appropriate role as coordinator and director of these global activities. But don't you think a you lot know, of this Ted, is... Actually, Ted, uh, you, you, Dr. Mann talks about a global problem and a global strategy in the part of the World Health Organization, but there's also a terrible irony going on there. A lot of the money that the World Health Organization and other organizations are spending on measles vaccines and, and smallpox vaccines and, and, and vaccines and the mass, mass immunization program in Africa uh, those are the things that, that really trouble Africans. Something like 12,000 African children die a day because of tuberculosis and measles, things that, that can be treated and prevented. So if you're a healthcare worker or a healthcare official in one of these African countries and you've got a, uh, very few funds, what do you spend it on? Do you spend it on AIDS that you, that you can't, can't cure or do you spend it on, uh, on something that you can cure? It's, right. uh, it's, it's a real problem that the World Health Organization and other uh, healthcare organizations have to face. Gentlemen, I've got to interrupt you both because I want to take us back to another subject. 
Uh, it is one that, uh, that we've begun to touch on uh, implicitly for the most part, not overtly. We can learn a good deal about the potential impact of AIDS by looking at the effects of other major epidemics in history. Here's a report from correspondent Joe Bergantino. Know the danger spots of the city, the places where the disease begins. In times of epidemic, there is fear and suspicion. The places with the easy pickups. Yes, these are the danger spots, the places that breed syphilis. In times of epidemic, there is blame. And you catch it only one way from a woman. Doesn't matter if she's a high school girl or a juke joint girl. There is this idea if we could only convince people to behave correctly, problems of disease would disappear. But the fact is, is that this becomes a means of punishing victims, but not effectively addressing the problem of disease. The Lord has sent his visitation upon us. Quiet! You shall all perish in the greatest agony. In the 14th century, as the bubonic plague wiped out a third of the world's population, a panicked society wrapped itself in religious ritual. Uh, 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 I have the plague. Stay away from us. There's nothing we can do for you. The sick are not cared for. The sick are converted uh, from a suffering loved one to a menacing enemy. From biblical times until only 20 years ago, those who suffered from leprosy were cast off into colonies. All my family turned their back on me. They didn't want to touch me, they didn't want to talk to me because they're afraid that I would give them my disease. When I'm upset, they say I don't look like a person, like some kind of monster, and it's hurt. And in the 1830s, when the cholera epidemic struck first in America's poorest urban neighborhoods, the rich blamed the lower classes for that fatal disease. If poor people and the disreputable or the discriminated against have the disease, it is much easier to both blame them for the cause and the spread of the disease and also to go after them uh, with uh, forms of restraint that may be excessive. It happened during the First World War. In an effort to halt the spread of venereal disease, 30 to 40,000 prostitutes were forced into internment camps in this country. In 1900, some states enacted laws against tuberculosis victims who were thought to be carelessly spreading the disease, often committing them to hospitals against their will. And the fear that people can get when they think that they're about to catch something that they were, are then helpless about is enormous. He was all afraid. We don't know which one was going to get it next. Some still remember the helplessness and fear that spread with the influenza epidemic of 1918. 500,000 Americans died. People were dropping by the thousands. And it got so bad you couldn't get an undertaker. But since then, thanks to penicillin and the polio vaccine, the Western world has seemed immune to the scourge of epidemics until AIDS. Will compassion or history be our guide? When we break the laws of God, we cannot expect that God would turn his head or violate his own justice. As a result, yes, we are witnessing a rising wave of stigmatization worldwide against Westerners in Asia, against Africans in Europe, against homosexuals, prostitutes. In fact, the army is going to try to court-martial a soldier for having sex with other people while knowingly carrying the AIDS virus. As we watch the AIDS epidemic unfold, we're going to learn a lot about um, the American people and our society and how we think about problems of dependency and illness. I'm Joe Bergantino for Nightline in New York. Fear can do terrible things to people and when people are afraid of dying, fear can make them look for help and for solutions almost anywhere. When we come back, we're going to look at some of the underground solutions or what people perceive to be solutions. We'll have that when we return in a moment. AIDS, a national town meeting, will continue in a moment. The two We're going to pick up where we left off a moment ago because uh, Father Bill Wood wanted to get a word in on the, uh, I guess on the question of uh, God's wrath. We have a tendency over 
uh, over the years, or we have had a tendency, anytime there is some kind of a plague, some kind of a disease that just envelops our society, we have a tendency to look upon that as, as God's vengeance against us. Got any thoughts on that? Yes. With all due respect to Reverend Falwell, uh, I think he ought to go back to his Bible, because Jesus says quite clearly when he's approached by his disciples, and the disciples ask him, uh, who is it that sinned? this man or his parents that he should be born blind and jesus to paraphrase him said you're simply asking the wrong questions god loves everyone unconditionally god does not operate as we human beings do with wrath god operates with love All right. Con congressman Danemark. i accept everything that the father has said but at the same time the Bible lays down very good standards for people in terms of human sexuality. We can't, as a people, separate morality and ethics from human sexuality anywhere there, any more than we can fly without an airplane. And candidly, as part of the sexual revolution in America the last 20 years, we are questioning whether those standards are still valid. And God's plan for man is one man and one woman who come together as a family unit in marriage. That's the basis of our civilization. And when Congress we choose to live at when we choose to live at variance with that standard, we must be prepared to accept the consequences of any conduct which we choose to pursue. Well, I'll tell you what. By that definition, Congressman, lesbians are the chosen people. Because they are at the lowest risk for contracting AIDS. All right, folks, I'll tell you what, we're going to move into a slightly different aspect of the story. <laughs> Inevitably, when a disease as devastating as AIDS begins to have an impact, people begin looking for anything that might give them some hope of survival. Mary Ellen Conway, medical reporter for our station KTRK in Houston, takes a look at some of the places people are turning in their search for help. Towns all along the Mexican border, from Matamoros and Nueva Laredo to Tijuana, have become meccas of sorts for desperate Americans, seeking not the fountain of youth, but what they hope will be the fountain of life. I'd like to purchase some ribavirin alone. They are AIDS patients, seeking drugs they believe may alter the fatal course of their disease. I feel like it should be my decision to be able to get this medicine in the United States because without it, I have no hope. The medicines are isoprenicin and ribavirin, compounds developed and currently undergoing testing in the United States. The drugs are not, however, commercially available to AIDS patients in the U.S. since the FDA has not approved them as being safe and effective. It works, you know, uh, it's effective. Each month, Richard Locke, who suffers from AIDS, travels to Mexico to purchase supplies of isoprenicin and ribavirin for himself and a few friends. My lover died in 1984. Had we been able to get this drug in 1984, he might be alive today. Dr. Gordon Crowfoot monitors more than 200 early-stage AIDS patients taking ribavirin. It's a safe drug. I think the people who are taking it are having fewer minor and fewer major problems. And I think the drug should be available in this country for people who do have a life-threatening terminal illness. I don't think they should have to go to Mexico to get it. It seems to be beneficial, and this is the only thing that, that possibly can help them in the early phases of the disease. So I certainly would uh, appeal to the government to release it. While the final results on ribovirin are not yet in, most physicians are skeptical about the value of isoprenicin in the fight against AIDS. Our conclusion was that, that, uh, that isoprenicine does not appear to be an effective agent in the treatment of any aspect of AIDS. And for people to go chasing all over the world to obtain this material is really unwise. But for AIDS patients in America, options are few. Well, let's get your medicine and then we... Only one AIDS drug, AZT, is approved for use by the FDA. AZT is no cure, but it does stop the AIDS virus from multiplying. It is expensive, over $7,000 a year, highly toxic, and only available to AIDS patients late in the course of their disease. AIDS patients are not only leaving the U.S. for treatment, 
Frustrated by the slow pace of research and desperate for a cure, they are literally taking matters into their own hands, searching outside the medical establishment. We're being our own doctors. Underground networks called guerrilla clinics are mixing and distributing remedies, unorthodox substances unknown, ignored, or dismissed by mainstream medicine. One such remedy is DNCB, a photosupply chemical now being applied to the skin. I need this, you know, and I need it, uh, so I'm making it. Jim Perez is making AL721, an extract of lefacin from egg yolks. But doctors are concerned that home remedies may be dangerous. I think if the drug looks promising, it should be made available uh, through legitimate laboratories uh, where these people can get it, not have to make it in a sink or a bathtub. There may be some relief in sight. Two weeks ago, the Food and Drug Administration announced new rules designed to speed up the availability of new drugs. Patients with serious or terminal illnesses will be allowed access to experimental drugs deemed promising prior to their approval. But some doctors feel that is still not going far enough. And I'm not saying just throw all these drugs at AIDS. You know, we have to be sure that they're relatively safe and, and relatively effective. But I can't understand the, why it's going so slow. I mean, this disease doesn't go slow. This disease goes fast. And we've just got to act faster to try to stop it. This is Mary Ellen Conway, KTRK, Houston, for Nightline. All right, while we are on the subject of what AIDS patients, AIDS victim, people who have AIDS, whatever you want to call them, uh, do in order to try as best they can to stay alive, we have two AIDS people who have people with AIDS, PWAs. I'm sorry, I'm going to get it right before the evening's over. Go ahead, sir, your point. Pretty soon, Ted, PWAs is going to stand for people without AIDS because there will be a cure. And with all the love and medicine and miracles we have in this world, especially the book by Dr. Bernie Siegel, that wonderful book that he wrote, there is cures out there and there is hope. I want to address you and the whole panel there, and especially Lieutenant Maklovich. It's the second time I've seen him, and it disturbs me to say that he's going to be dead in a year, and then he corrected himself. I really firmly believe that what you say, your words are very powerful, and your body listens to you, your little cells listen to you. I've had AIDS for four years, diagnosed with KS at UCLA, in May of 1983, and I've gone through some treatment of interferon that didn't work, and I've done some alternative, which is meditation, relaxation, healing imagery, diet, nutrition, and vitamins, and it's all worked for myself, but the attitude is number one, and if you keep on saying you're going to be dead in a year, you will be dead, and I've used that firm belief with myself and a lot of my friends here and using that same belief, and we're here to stand here that we are living with AIDS, we are AIDS survivors, and we are not AIDS victims. One of the things we're here to do tonight, and, and clearly if it works for you, wonderful. But one of the things we're here to do tonight is to exchange information. And before that is allowed to linger on and perhaps give false hope to someone, maybe it deserves to give genuine hope to people, I would like to turn to Dr. Fauci in, in Washington again. What of this notion that your own psychological attitude, your mental attitude, can help you stay alive, that does not seem like such an unreasonable idea. No, the mental attitude in and of itself is not going to suppress the virus, but, but, the, uh, but a healthy mental attitude, a feeling of optimism, a feeling of hope, uh, in ways that are somewhat nebulous, nonetheless do contribute to the well-being of an individual. And I think in conjunction with specific therapy against the virus, also perhaps together with reconstitution of the immune response, the attitude that that gentleman just mentioned is very important in helping an individual get through physical and psychological crises. So I applaud that, and I think in conjunction with appropriate specific therapy, that's something that is a very positive thing. All right. We have another, uh, another questioner, another person with AIDS. Go ahead, sir. Hi, my name is Paul Jaspers, and I've had AIDS for over a year. I, uh, shortly after I was diagnosed, I was refused services of a pedicure in a West Hollywood beauty salon because they overheard that I had AIDS. My question is, there is an anti-discrimination law against people with AIDS or people perceived to have AIDS in the city of West Hollywood where the salon is. However, I'm, I'm wondering what is being done so that in the future, as I continue to live with AIDS, I will not be denied the right to eat in a restaurant or the right to shop in a clothing store or swim in a public pool or have my teeth cleaned by a dentist. And I'm in the middle of two lawsuits regarding this refusal of services at this point they're both pending one is criminal and one is civil 
I want to know what is being done to ensure that those of us that are continuing to live with AIDS will not be discriminated against in the future. All right, Jeff Levy of the, uh, well, if you want to pick up on that, Leonard, go oh. ahead. I'd like to uh, comment to the, the, the first gentleman that spoke. I'll tell you what, let, let me ask you then to hold off and see if we can't get from Jeff Levy a, a response. Jeff, you're with the, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. I know you are, you are current uh, on some of the, uh, the legal aspects of this. Tell us what you know. Unfortunately, you can't look to the federal government right now for help. Uh, you're going to be dependent on laws like in the city of West Hollywood and also state laws that ban discrimination based on handicap or perception of handicap. AIDS has been generally uh, understood to include that. Unfortunately, the uh, Mies Justice Department doesn't see things that way and what limited federal protection there might have been for people with AIDS or people perceived to being at risk to AIDS has been denied under Section 504 of the Federal Rehabilitation Act. Uh, in fact, in a very perverse definition of, of anti-discrimination protections, uh, the Justice Department claimed that an irrational fear of transmission uh, could be justification for denying employment or other types of protections. Uh, in fact, um, anti-discrimination laws are designed to overcome irrational fears and here the Justice Department was encouraging them. Uh, what we're going to depend on at the federal level is new legislation that will either clarify what Section 504 covers but also broaden it because that only covers federally funded programs. We need to have national legislation that protects people from discrimination based on AIDS or HIV infection or the perception thereof. All right. Uh, let me just make a quick point, if I may, and then Linda Lampkin, I promise you, I'll, I'll come back to you. Uh, this program uh, continues to be, I guess, for everyone involved in it, uh, viewers, listeners, audience, panelists, uh, even me, something of an endurance contest. Uh, but I must point out that we have been going now for about three hours and 45 minutes. Uh, we have only about 10 or 12 minutes left, and we would like to dedicate most of that time, indeed, almost all of it, to those people who have been hanging on so patiently, our radio listeners who want to get through on the phone. But Linda Lampkin, you've had very little opportunity to speak tonight, so go ahead, please. Okay, well, in terms of employment relationship, most of the contracts negotiated do have uh, d discrimination language within them, which means that through the contract, an employer can't discriminate against an employee for having AIDS. And you can take a contractual grievance, you don't have to go through a, a lawsuit procedure, which may be more more quick and more expedited. But as an individual, if, if, if this man, for example, wants to go swim in a public pool, yeah. if he wants to go to a restaurant and they said, no, we know you have AIDS, we don't want you here, Jeff, there's not a whole lot he can do? Or? He has to depend on the state laws and there certainly is no federal or national policy in that regard. All right, let's go to our first caller now from New Hampshire. Go ahead, New Hampshire. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm calling to find out if you can get AIDS from a mosquito bite. All right. Uh, uh, Dr. Volbeding. Yeah. Real quickly, because I know we want to get to some of the others. The, there was data presented at the recent meeting in Washington that I think very conclusively proved to us that that's not possible. A study done in South Florida showed that, that AIDS, even in areas with lots of mosquitoes, is spread by direct sexual contact and by intravenous drug use, not by the mosquitoes. All right, call from Kansas. Go ahead, please. Yes, I have um, two brief examples of um, AIDS patients in denial. In one particular, the patient asked me after he came down from ICU, could he go to uh, the public fitness center and use the Capizzi Whirlpool type thing? Um, instead, I felt like he was asking, would, uh, I felt like what he should have been asking, is it safe for me to use these facilities? And in another instance where a patient was being dismissed and from a previous IV site had burnt his arm and had started bleeding and he was standing at the counter and was thinking nothing of this. And I'm wondering how viable is the AIDS virus once outside of the body? You know, I had a little trouble understanding your, your second question. Is, is uh, Dr. Volberding, could you... As I understood it, the question was basically how, how can you catch AIDS from such public uh, facilities such as a, a spa or a hot tub? Well, I mean, the answer um, is you can't, And the answer right? is you can't. Okay, yeah. now the what about... virus the, isn't the, viable outside the body for prolonged periods of time. The second... Now, well, let me stop you there. When you say it's not viable for prolonged periods of time, is it viable for a minute, two minutes, five minutes? The amount of virus in any body fluid, including the blood, is very, very small, and it requires direct 
inoculation of the blood into, into your own bloodstream or prolonged exposure of your skin or your mucous membranes to the, to the fluid. May I interject something? Congressman Dannemeyer. Uh, there are reputable studies in journals of repute that have established that the virus can live in concentrated outside, solutions. outside the body for up to 10 days. In concentrated solutions from laboratory and, uh, culture. I think you better put that in perspective. You know, this no. matter of discrimination is another aspect, too, you know. People yes. who don't have the virus, Ted, have civil rights, too. No, there's they no don't question about that, but Congressman, do me a favor, please. Uh, I, I respect the reading that you've done on it and the research that you've done on it. Let yeah. me go to Washington. Dr. Fauci, I think, is recognized by every medical person on this panel as being one of the world's leading experts. Let's let him have the last word on the issue of whether the, of whether the virus can or cannot live. Uh, Dr. Fauci? Yeah, I think that I think citing studies that the virus can live for two, three, four, what have you, days on a tabletop or in a petri dish is really irrelevant to the transmissibility. And it's that kind of diversion that takes us away from understanding how this virus is transmitted. If a virus is on a tabletop for four or five days, that still doesn't take away from the fact that the virus is transmitted by sexual contact, by blood or blood products, or by mother to child. It's on the table whether it's alive or dead. It has nothing to do with the transmissibility. And if we focus on that, you're diverting away from understanding how it is and is not transmitted. All right, we're going to another call, this time from North Carolina. Go ahead, caller. Yes, uh, what my question is that uh, they have studies that show that there are 500-plus uh, children who have AIDS, uh, and there are expected to be about 2,000 in the, in the next four years or so. Uh, all of these are, are in utero. Uh, is it possible for a child to get AIDS from the mother by breastfeeding? Interesting question. Uh, Dr. Bobinning? There is some evidence that, that that might be the case in some cases, yeah. So it would be a good idea then for a, a mother who may have some question, perhaps if she's been a drug user, uh, to get a blood test? By all means, women that, are, that are, have engaged in high-risk behaviors or whose sexual partners have should be tested before they become pregnant if they're if they're considering that or during the pregnancy if if termination is an option i almost hate to open this can of worms but uh, tim johnson and maybe father wood will have to come back to you on this if a mother carrying a child takes the blood test and finds that she is an aids carrier uh is abortion called for I won't have answer that from a moral basis, but it certainly is a legitimate consideration medically. And even somebody like Dr. C. Everett Koop, who personally opposes abortion, says it's something that a pregnant woman who tests positive for AIDS should be informed about. Father Ward? I appreciate that that was a medical statement. From a moral point of view, uh, the, uh, the fetus is uh, a human life, and we wouldn't take the human life any more than we would take Leonard's life because he has a disease. All right. Caller from Texas. Okay. My name is Dean Ray. I'm calling from Texas for those people who are innocent bystanders of the AIDS epidemic. As a provider of food stuff, if I am marketing a food product that in any way implicates that it might be a carcinogenic on the Delaney Amendment, I'm required to remove it from the market by law. I'd like to address my question to Mr. Levy is what's wrong with identifying the carriers of aid you talk about their civil rights to their privacy and so forth but what about the protection of the innocent people who do not live in a promiscuous lifestyle that what about their civil responsibility to identify themselves so that sex partners health workers the public in general would have the right to know that this person is exposing them to the disease because as members of families who do not permiss uh, participate in a promiscuous lifestyle, we need the money that you're talking about providing National Health Service for to provide health insurance for our own families, not to help someone who has uh, a promiscuous lifestyle and is producing the AIDS epidemic. So if you have created your problem, why shouldn't you pay your own way and provide your own cure. As citizens who pay taxes, and this is the tax money you're talking about, why should we have to pay for a disease that we have nothing to do with creating? 
All right. It, it is in some respects difficult to understand how that question can still be asked four hours into this program. However, 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 uh, I assure you, and, uh, and this audience seems to be, you know, slanted in another direction, but I assure you that this gentleman from Texas represents a great many people who are watching tonight and who, if they were here, would ask you exactly the same question, Jeff. Well, I, I don't think this is a society that chooses to judge people about the nature of their disease before we help pay for their care. But I think the other question that needs to be addressed is that of whether we in the gay and lesbian community are placing civil rights above public health. And I think the answer to that is twofold. One is that good public health requires a healthy respect for civil liberties or else you're not going to get the cooperation that is needed to cope with this epidemic. But I think the second thing and is really much more disturbing to me is the implication that for some reason the gay community would place our civil rights above the public health. We know the suffering that's entailed with this disease. We have suffered more than any other community. We've dealt with it longer than any other community. We've responded to it responsibly, more so than any other community. We would not wish this on anyone else. And if we felt for any reason the measures that we have opposed would really contain this epidemic, why we wouldn't be opposing them, because we know what it means to get this disease more than anyone else. There has been a man who I am told has been standing up there for most of the last four hours, so if, if by virtue of nothing else but persistence, you certainly deserve a chance to ask a question. Go ahead, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Bruce Merkin, and I am one of thousands who will be marching on Washington, D.C. in October for lesbian and gay rights and to demand that the federal government treat AIDS as a health issue, not a political football. And my question is for Jeff Levy. Um, given that the Reagan administration has refused to do anything meaningful about AIDS education, and that refusal has undoubtedly cost many thousands of innocent lives already and will cost many more, uh, can you imagine any excuse for the administration's attitude other than that they simply don't care? And what do you think that those of us who do care can do about it? And, and to whom are you addressing the question? Uh, Jeff Levy. In 30 seconds or less. Um, I think a lot of the delayed response reflected a homophobia in the system and an internalized you know, a form of neglect that, that is reflected in not being familiar with a lot of minority groups. But I think what we're seeing now is a twofold problem. One is in the education area, a sex phobia. Because it isn't, we're not just talking about homosexuality, we're talking about heterosexual behavior as well. And this administration still doesn't want to grapple with the issue of talking about sex. Um, and I, and I guess we're also dealing with an administration that is not willing to devote the financial resources in a sense, bust their budget perspectives uh, to, to cope with the health care needs and the research needs that will really contain this epidemic. All right, Congressman Dannemeyer, and, and b before you say what you have to say, I can't believe that I'm about to say what I'm going to say to our affiliates. Uh, we've been going for four hours. We're going to run over a little bit uh, because we still, have, we still have some things that, that we want to show you. We still have a few things that need to be said. Uh, and even if this isn't watched in, in one bulk, I suspect this program in some form will have an afterlife. We're going to be uh, cutting the tapes down and making the tapes available. We're going to be making the, uh, the transcripts of this program available. And I hope that in some small form, uh, all of this material is going to help focus public attention, educate a little, perhaps change some attitudes in this country, uh, but we are going over. Now, Congressman Dannemeyer, what do you Thank you very much, say? Ted. Up until now, from the outset of the AIDS epidemic, Congress has appropriated almost a half a billion dollars. Most of that money has gone into research trying to find a cure. If you ask the doctors around this panel, I think they'll tell you that we have, we in Congress, have put into the spending stream pipeline for research for a cure of vaccine about all the money the system can assimilate. And I think we've done a responsible job and we will continue to do that because the people of the United States are a compassionate people and through the Congress, we're gonna do everything we can to find a cure if we can. Just Two clarifications uh, uh, for the record, Ted, that are really critical. One is, yes, Congress has put a lot of money in, but the administration has not, has consistently failed to request it. 
Every year it's Congress that has had to, had to add money and the administration has come back asking for less money than was spent in the All previous right. year until this year. Mm -hmm. The second point is I think you're wrong in saying that the system can't absorb more resources. If you look at the professional judgment budgets that the, even the, the people at the National Institutes of Health have put together, they could spend and they could valuably employ a whole lot more resources than they've been given. Dr. Fauci, in, in uh, Washington, that's your shop, NIH. Uh, you got all the money you can handle? or I, I mean, I've never ever heard anyone say, well, we got more money than we know what to do with. But, I mean, re realistically, do you have, you have the money you need, or could you, do you need more? Well, we constantly reevaluate the need, uh, and in fact, constantly revise the budget. The system is moving so fast that we need, and hopefully we'll get the flexibility to request and get more money as we need it. Hopefully the flexibility of the system will allow us to make those kinds of adjustments as we need to make thrusts into new areas of research. All right, one more question now from uh, the gentleman over here. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, sir, I would like to uh, really tell you why I'm here. I'm a father of uh, three uh, young children and uh, in light of all of the uh, information that has come forth from the, the um, international convention this week, I realize that I face the uh, prospect of raising my children in a generation where we face an unbelievable epidemic or pandemic, if you will. I uh, uh, appreciated what Mayor Feinstein had to say about her offering of a solution. Uh, first of all, for research, then for care, and then for a change in behavior. Uh, the aspect of research uh, it seems to be such a, a noble aspiration, but it's so long uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, it's something that right now we want to spend as much money as we can on, but the fact is we're dealing with a lethal disease, and right now the cure is elusive. Um, the idea of care is something that I believe that everyone who's present here tonight and who has called on the telephone this evening and everyone on the panel is absolutely in favor of and realizes that we need to embrace this and the people that are actually victims of this uh, with as much care and compassion as we can as, as human beings. But finally, I want to address the aspect of behavior change. And that is, every time I've heard anyone, any expert, relate to the idea of behavior change, the very first thing that they have mentioned is that the way to avoid contraction of this disease is through abstinence. And then there's kind of What's laughable about abstinence? I realize that um, this is completely runs juxtaposed to what we've been taught as a society for the last 15, 20 years. But in light of the consequences, I'd like to ask, I don't know if I should address the psychologist on the panel. I um, uh, enjoy sex. Uh, I am a sexually active uh, man. I've been married to one woman for 11 years. And I appreciate uh, the sex act as much as anyone. But what my question has to do with is, um, uh, although I enjoy sex, men and women enjoy sex, does anyone enjoy it enough to die for it? Ted, you know, if I were a parent and I had children, Leonard Matlovich. and my son or daughter went to a party, I would say to them, if you go to the party, I wish you wouldn't drink. But if you do drink, and you're driving home, don't drive, call me, I'll come and get you. I may be angry at you, but I love you. And I think we need to give the same advice to our children about AIDS. You know, as a, as, an, as a parent, I prefer that you not have sex. But if you have sex, these are the facts that you need to know to save your life and to save the life of the person you may have sex with. We got to give our children this information. All right, I'll tell you what, folks, we have to, we have to take a break again. When we come back, uh, I urge you to stay. If you've stuck with us this long, I urge you to stay because when we come back, you're going to see a very, very moving piece about a problem that we have not yet addressed. Uh, and that is the problem of burnout among health care workers who are dealing with people with AIDS. We'll have that when we return. who have AIDS. Aside from the victims themselves, no one is closer to the agony of the AIDS crisis than the health professionals, doctors, nurses, and administrators who confront it daily. The impact on them can be overwhelming, as Nightline discovered in Houston while visiting the only hospital in the country that deals solely 
with AIDS patients. In the 20 years I've been in nursing, I feel like I've been training for now. I think for the first time in my life, I'm doing what my idea of a nurse has always been. In a lot of cases on the unit, we're everything for the patient. Brother, mother, father, sister, the whole bit. We are talking about young people that are having severe fatigue where just to get up and reach for a glass is an effort. I'm not glad I'm the one to hand the glass. You have people that their breathing can change in a matter of two minutes. You can walk in the room, walk out and go back and it's a problem. It seems like it goes in cycles where we lose several in a short period of time. And I don't know why it does that, but we're going through it again. We went through it right after the Christmas holidays, and it's starting again. We're losing a lot of these patients. Almost like in our second wave of patients that we've got close to over the last few months. They're all getting very sick. They're all passing on. You know, and it's like one day they're, they're coming walking in, the next day they're in the bed. And when you find that that person is just like you, that has the same aspirations, the same desires, the same fears, any body that has worked with AIDS patient will tell you, it's almost frightening. The question that they pose to you is, when the time comes, will you have the same courage? I'm proud of myself. I want to be a galleon. I want to live a galleon death. I mean, I don't want to shrivel up and cry and, and be weak. I want to try to be as strong as I can for everyone. The saddest part about all this is what I have been experiencing for the, the past few weeks is watching not the physical deterioration, but rather the mental, with the AIDS dementia, the mental zoning out, not being in touch. And the saddest part about it is that the individual knows he's in and out of it. He or she is in and out of it. Everything physically is the person you know. But the person that responds to you is not. It tends to shake you. They may not recognize you or they may recognize you, but they don't know where they are. They don't remember what you said the next minute, they'll ask you the same question over and over. And coming from a young person, you know, you don't expect it. These are people you've talked to and, you know, have really gotten close to, and now they just really don't know who you are. Are you very fearful now? Do you feel fearful? Yeah. One of the things that really uh, it's very painful is to see parents losing their children. It's, it's a very painful experience. Uh, sometimes uh, they look at you and they, they wonder if you understand their pain. Uh, they almost tell you with their eyes, you know, you just don't know how much this hurt. I think the hardest thing now is that we're realizing it's a whole new group of patients. The ones we started with are there. They're gone. But we remember these people. We remember the witness of their lives and often the courage and the steadfastness of their deaths. I tend to go to memorial services and I find it gives me a sense of completion. You know, I've gone all the way through. One week we had like 14 deaths in one week, and I think that was hard on everybody. And it, it, it releases. You get to cry if you want to. You get some laughter. It's, it's a celebration of their life instead of a mourning of their death. We have a patient now who is still alive. I've gotten very close to. It's going to be very hard when he's not there. And we lost one at Christmas time that I still expect to see come through the door. Well, I have to really admit that the support group for me last week was, uh, I was really grateful to all of you. Group is the place where we can get together and say, hey, I'm hurting. I actually got down to taking a look at the validity of my work 
which really was um, something that I really had to face. The guy in 31, last night, I was coming down the hall, and he's happy-go-lucky, I'm a real great guy. And I walk in to check his IV right at 9 o'clock, and he says to me, can we talk about debt? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, well, okay, stop what you're doing. The fear is there, you know, the generalized fear is there. Mm -hmm. And um, I just look at these guys and what they've been through and what they're going through and what they had to go through. I am just awed, just totally awed. They are so brave, and it hurts me that, that the public doesn't realize, you know, what these people are like. Mm -hmm. And it bothers me that the public was, is not. You afraid? What are you fearing the most? Pain, I suppose. I will not let you have pain. You're taking care of them. And in doing so, you, you are nurturing this person. And this person is nurturing you too, as a whole. And then you see them go. And it's, it's like you lose someone. And uh, it's very frustrating. It's, it's painful. But they really are the gods. And they were young. Some of them are as young as my children. And they're all younger than I am. You know, and it, it's hard. Every patient laying up there, gay, straight, or other, is somebody's son, somebody's brother. That's our families we are losing. And before this is over, this is going to touch almost every household in this country. It's not a time for judgment. It's a time for caring. Only two more thoughts. And please understand what I mean when I say this is not their problem. It's our problem. And the other thought is simply to say thank you. Thank you to all of you who have been with us this evening, both on radio and on television. Thank you to our very distinguished panel. Uh, they have shown not only great patience, but have shared their wisdom with us from uh, all parts of this country. Thank you to the audience that's been with us here live. And my most special thanks to my friends and colleagues, whose, name you, whose names, uh, those of you who are watching on television, will see crawling by on your screen now. Thank you, and good night. transcript of tonight's broadcast, send $5 to Nightline Transcripts, 2 John Street, New York, New York, 10038. Nightline is a presentation of ABC News.